dog. Greeting the mailman, I think, outside in the background. And got a couple more people joining. I always think about these um, online meetings. If it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done. People always seem to come flying in at the last second. I see that most um, most people have their uh, cameras and their um, microphones turned off. Maybe it's defaulting to that. Perfectly uh, welcome during uh, the beginning part to unclick uh, yourself and make your microphones uh, active if you wish to jump in, ask any questions before we go. Also, um, just um, letting a couple more people in. We're at the fill time uh, portion of the meeting. Okay, so we, I think I've got it set so people will automatically come in. I'll keep my uh, eye on the screen here to make sure that some people don't get... Um, caught in the waiting room uh, trying to come in uh, to our meeting. It's now uh, just one minute after one. I know that there'll be a couple stragglers probably that come in. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for joining us today and congratulations for making the choice to pursue your CPC. Uh, before we get started today, a couple little housekeeping things and introductions. Uh, first off, um, during the presentation, um, we used to do these live and they were wonderful in a live setting because um, as a presenter, I could uh, look at facial expressions and watch your hand as you wrote down notes and understand when people were confused and people would uh, feel more comfortable and jumping in and asking questions and participating in conversation. You know what it's like. We've been doing this for years now since the beginning of pandemic, lots of online meetings. You just kind of sit there and um, turn off your camera and answer your phone and go get a coffee in the middle of the presentation. Hope you don't get caught. Um, you probably should keep your microphones turned off because I know we're all busy people and your phone's gonna ring and people are gonna walk into your office. That's great. Um, but also, um, I'm not gonna be watching the screen on the right-hand side for people who type in questions. I, I'm gonna see them eventually. Um, but if you see something on a screen, or if I say something during our presentation today that causes you to wonder and want to ask a question, just click on your microphone, turn your mute off, and jump in and just say, hey, it's me um, here in Edmonton. I just want to ask you a quick question about that, Steve. And I would really, really appreciate that. Um, it allows me to um, know that you're awake and that I might have even said something wrong. <laughs> I might have confused myself and said something uh, um, by using the wrong word. That happens to old guys like me. So please feel free to unclick your microphone and jump in. But while you're not asking questions, um, please turn it off so that uh, if your phone rings, people walk in your office and your dog barks like mine just did, um, it doesn't interrupt the group. Um, you can leave your camera on, you can turn your camera off. That makes no difference to me. Once I get into full screen mode, I don't see too much of what's going on anyways, other than what's on the screen. So that's totally up to you. Um, if you want to turn your camera on when you ask the question, that's okay with me also. We're going to have time at the end also to ask questions. Um, and uh, so here we go. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Steve Jones. I live in Ontario. I've been in the staffing industry since before some of you were born, 1983. So when I first started my first staffing company, um, I've run a company and grown a company to have uh, over 23, 25 offices in Canada with five, 600 recruiters. 
and uh, four hundred million dollars in sales with seven eight thousand contractors temporary workers out on assignment per day um we've purchased companies sold companies um i'm pretty familiar with what goes on in the industry i have served probably uh, maybe i don't even know eight or ten years as access president um not for the past decade or so but um between 1980 and uh, 2000 and uh, 13, uh, served for approximately 20 years as the chairperson of government and public relations. And so I understand um, legislation. I think I understand the industry, technology, the issues we're all confronted with every day. So feel free to challenge me with your questions um, and to go deep. If you want to go deep, I'm okay with that too. Um, sometimes you attend these type of training sessions and you find someone who's um, a topic expert, but not an industry expert. Um, I hope to think that um, while I might not know the answers to everything, that I at least can understand your day and what you go through. Uh, I now operate a company called Business Leadership Corp, and I consult for dozens of Canadian and U.S. Um, staffing companies and other companies also in their business process, hiring business models, um, coaching executives and so on. So um, I'm here and I'm around the industry and I've been teaching CPC courses um, since the onset, since the beginning of our certified personnel consultant. Today, we're going to go through a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to try to finish up by four o'clock. I think the two golden rules of these sessions are get started on time and finish on time. Everything in between will take care of itself. So we're going to try to be finished uh, by four o'clock. I will stay on longer for people who want to ask questions, but please feel comfortable in signing off when we hit four o'clock and I'll gun to make sure we've covered everything we need to between now and then. For those people who are going to be here again tomorrow for our second legal section, uh, we're going to go a little bit quicker in the beginning because there are several screens um, near the beginning and topics that are a little bit redundant. And that's because some people don't take them in the order that you're taking them. So we need to cover those things. So we'll save a little bit of time tomorrow and um, I'll make that same announcement for tomorrow in case there's some people who missed today and came on tomorrow and I'll give them the opportunity to find out um, about those screens in a different fashion so I don't take up everyone's time again. Um, to start off with, I'm gonna flip over and share my screen. Um, I think I every time I do this and I've only done this a couple of thousand times, um, I have to um, do, let's just make sure I got the right one here. And that didn't work. There we go. And I'm going to share my screen. And I uh, just want to make sure that everyone, before we get started, can hear me and also see uh, the screen. No, I'm going to, that's not for me. Can see the screen that says legal aspects. And so if somebody wants to pop yeah. their microphone off and just confirm, that's good. You can see it. Yes, yeah, all good. Awesome. Uh, it's not uncommon to get about four or five screens past something and I've... Uh, forgotten that I've frozen my screens or I'm not sharing. So thank you for that. By the way, if I happen to do that today and um, I freeze a screen or something and it doesn't seem to be in line with what I'm saying, feel free also to unmute your mic and yell at me and get me uh, on topic. Okay, so we've got a couple of uh, things in the chat room. Uh, perfect. People confirm they can hear me. Good. Awesome. Okay. So I want to congratulate you for making the choice to um, take your CPC. The Certified Personnel Consultant is the only certification, professional certification that is available in the staffing services industry in Canada. You will from time to time come across some private companies that offer some kind of training courses and they will name them something that sounds like a certification. Um, but rest assured that the um, Access is the only organization in Canada offering recognized professional certifications for the staffing services industry. Um, and oh, let's get this these screens moving. 
There we go. Um, the CPC certification, I think, as you probably already know, has a bunch of modules. Um, we've got the legal aspects of staffing, which uh, we're going to be talking about today. Tomorrow, we're talking about the legal aspects of recruitment. So that's more generic legal issues concerning things like human rights and and other uh, workers' compensation and other things that we need to know about in the course of doing our jobs. Um, we've got a health and safety certification module, a business practices and ethics module, which, by the way, I'll also be facilitating, I think, in a couple of weeks from now. Um, we've got recruitment and selection. And in the near future, you're going to have the opportunity to also opt in on a sales um, module that is optional for you. And at the end of um, completing all of the CPC courses, um, when the sales one comes available, you'll have a choice to take recruitment or sales or both. When, this, um, when all of those are completed, we have what's called the challenge exam. The challenge exam is mostly a multiple guess exam. And so I want to um, let you know that as we go through the content today and in all the future courses, um, it's not important that you memorize tons of information that is really drilled down. So, for example, the number of weeks that a person is entitled to for notice relative to their tenure with the company or the number of hours in between shifts that a person is entitled to. These are things that every single province is legislated and regulated under their Employment Standards Act or labor legislation and um, will change from province to province with a lot of similarities, but not always exactly the same. So the important thing to learn as we go through this, and of course, I'm going to give you exact examples as we go through it today, but the important thing to learn is what are the issues you know, oh, I didn't, re you know, hopefully at the end of the day, you're going to say things like, I didn't know that that was legislated or regulated and that I should be looking that up and I should know that. Now, the examples I'm going to give you today are accurate for the provinces that I give the examples in. But once you know what topics and issues exist, then you're in a good position to say, maybe I ought to check that um, as you're going about your day to day work to make sure that um, your, and, and by the way, legislation changes all the time, um, and it's updated. And so, uh, you know, just because you knew it two years ago, doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly what it says today. Now the access, um, because you're here today means that you are an employee owner or manager of a access member company. And, um, in order to be an access member company, the company um, makes application and makes promises to commit to our code of ethics and standards and meets our um, our criteria for acceptance as a member. And then each employee manager or owner of that company automatically becomes a member. And so as a result of being an employee or um, participant in a member company, you can go to the access access.org website and log in as a member and get access to the access, access ACC, um, to the access um, member content, which will tell you about schedules and meetings and will allow you to download things um, that are helpful. And if you don't have a user account, uh, we're not super sophisticated, and because people come and go from access companies, all you need to do is send Jennifer an email, and you have her email address because she set you up for this meeting. Um, send her an email saying, hey, can I start a member account? And she'll use your email address and give you a temporary um, login, and then you can then have that um, to log in um, going forward. And one of the things that... Um, a member company does when they um, become or accepted as members is they make a commitment to the access code of ethics and standards, and they understand um, what the access mission statement is. And so the access mission is to identify and communicate and monitor industry standards and ethical business practices to positively influence and protect the regulatory and business environment that impacts our members and the people that we serve. 
So the people we serve are our customers and our candidates and the employees who work for us if we're in the temporary help business or the contractors who work for us if we're in the contracting space. To promote the credibility and visibility of the industry to the business community, to governments, and to the general public. And so you probably know if you've been around the industry for a little while that from time to time, various advocacy groups, whether they represent unions or um, particular groups, um, point a finger at uh, the staffing services industry, trying to get more direct access to employment uh, and an opportunity for employment directly with employers, trying to take the middle person out. They um, Some are opposed to the notion of part-time and temporary work and contract work. And of course, the reality is that these are all full opportunities for people to get experience, to get access to jobs. Um, we become the sort of human resources utility where hundreds of thousands of people every week and every month in Canada can um, get access to find jobs, be connected to jobs, um, to get introduced to employers for things that are most applicable to their skills and their availability, their location, and so on, which they may not have um, readily availability to know about or know how to get there and to, to get it done for themselves. So we become the utility, just like um, the uh, an electric utility or water utility might get these vast resources and then bring them to the right people at the right time and for the right purpose and do it in a safe and productive manner. We provide our members with strategic support services, programs and tools, things like the CPC and the things that you can download and use from the member services area and also things like member services um, at chapter meetings and annual conferences. Our code of ethics says, and each member company when they join Access make a, makes a commitment to uphold the Access Code of Ethics. And it says exactly that as members of the Association of Access, we commit to uphold this Code of Ethics and Standards and to display it prominently in our business place. And we support the principles set forth below and acknowledge the, that compliance with these principles is in the best interest of the member companies, their candidates, their employees, their client organization, and the reputation of our industry as a whole in Canada. And so we're going to, um, today we're going to learn about those um, code of ethics and standards. We're also going to um, talk about employment standards uh, legislation and how it's applicable to us in Canada. We're going to try to identify various employee and employer statuses, including um, co-employment and liability issues and how things differ or are unique for temporary help agencies, independent contractors, and so on. We're going to try to make sure that we understand um, licensing and employment standards um, in a more detailed fashion, and we're going to commit to uphold um, all of the standards that we learned today. So first, let's kind of jump into the employment standards legislation um, and talk a little bit about it. The, now, if I was in a group of live people, we'd be asking people, hey, how do you, what do you know about employment standards and where did you learn it? And, um, you know, we, I think probably the thing that is most obvious uh, when we do this in a live session is that a lot of people think that they know, um, but because it's such a moving target, because it changes from province to province, jur jurisdiction to jurisdiction, industry to industry, um, and it's um, provincially legislated and is constantly evolving, that what we sometimes think we know um, gets us in a little bit more trouble than actually um, admitting that we didn't know. So it's important um, that we understand the law. We want, um, so, you know, we've got these uh, little, um, um, questions about what's the right answer um, to this question. So why is it so important to know the law? Well, um, knowledge will help us educate our customers and reduce their risk. Yes, it will. To protect um, your employees and to ensure you receive, uh, that they receive their minimum entitlements. I hope that your companies don't only offer the minimum entitlements, but it's important that you do understand what they are. 
to improve productivity, to eliminate misunderstandings and problems. Most misunderstandings and problems that arise in a company come from communication. And um, if we are communicating our understanding of the laws and reinforcing those laws, policies, and practices, then typically we can run a pretty smooth business to protect your professional reputation and limit your legal liabilities, to earn and respect the dedication from clients who rely on you. You know, in selling in the staffing services industry, we talk about consultative sales. So understanding the laws, legislation, regulations, and best business practices is always good so that you can help your customers to make good decisions uh, in their business. And it built, helps build your credibility in your relationship with your clients and your employees to differentiate you and your company in the marketplace. You know, not every company is a member of Access. Um, we represent the vast majority of the industry, but there are a bunch of companies out there that are not members <clears throat> and letting them know that you have your CPC and that you are a member company of Access will automatically differentiate you, especially from those, as they call them sometimes, fly-by-night operators who are attempting to exploit workers and take advantage of things in the workplace by cutting corners and not adhering to all of the laws. We want you to help to you to retain your workforce because um, it's such a valuable resource for us. Um, and of course, that we do this through adhering to the code of ethics and standards. So we want to talk a little bit about the different types of law in Canada, which will eventually take us into the details of employment standards. <clears throat> Starting from the top, um, I'd like to talk about the um, constitutional law. So we talk about people saying, oh, that's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that's protected under the Charter. That's part of our Constitution. We talk about constitutional law and they say, oh, we're going to... Um, we're going to appeal that to the Supreme Court. Basically, the Canadian Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is what I refer to as the law of laws. It doesn't drill down into the specifics of regulations. What it does is it says, who has authority to make laws? Who has the jurisdictional responsibility for different types of laws? and different types of services and taxes in Canada. It tells us what the um, rights are for, the, um, for us as a whole to protect the benefit of Canada. And it also defines the rights of individuals for individual rights and freedoms. So constitutional law will tell us whether or not other types of laws are legal. So when it says, oh, I'm going to appeal that to the Supreme Court of Canada, what they're really doing is they're um, uh, appealing the constitutionality of another law or business practice. So they're not really making laws and writing legislation. They're creating the rules for laws and who has authority over them and whether that law um, is appropriate under the constitutional standards that are set. And then, of course, we've got statute law or legislative law um, and or bylaws. So statute laws are when an authority like a, leg a provincial legislature or the federal government of Canada, when elected politicians um, propose a law and that law goes through a series of readings and committees until eventually elected participants. So even if it's um, um, even if it's a bylaw in a city to determine whether or not they're going to allow um, stores to be open at a particular time or whether um, you can make noise or what's going to happen with speed limits or parking violations. These are all things that um, a municipal um, group of people from City Hall who are voted as municipal politicians can vote upon or provincial legislation, what might have to do with health care, education, and employment, or federal laws, which might have to do with federal crimes and taxation. So these are all different levels of government defined in constitutional law, who has the authority to write statutes or legislation. And the Employment Standards Act falls under provincial legislation. So 
the Constitution says things that have to do with employment um, that are not federally regulated industries will fall under the provinces. And then the provinces write laws like the Employment Standards Act, Le Nom de Travail, labor standards in different provinces, different names for the same type of thing. And then we've got this notion called common law. And common law, so one of the more common, two most common uses um, that we hear about the term common law refers to common law marriage. So for example, um, people who have lived together as if they were married um, under the same domicile and having children and sharing their resources um, can be deemed to be just the same as married in common law. In other words, the courts look at a set of circumstances and they say, well, we do have kind of laws and regulations around that sort of thing, um, but yours doesn't isn't specifically regulated. And so we're going to look at laws in common to all the people in this jurisdiction. And if the circumstances fit, then that will become laws in common to all of you. Now, by the way, I'm not uh, a lawyer. And so I'm using very layman's um, types of expressions to try to get us so that we understand this really clearly without uh, having to go to law school. So common law is just that. It's those rules that have already been decided by courts and by statute and by constitution that now become in common to all of us because the number of decisions the courts have made in the past or other laws that are fundamentally similar. So this is why marriage, common law marriage, fell under common law. We also talk about common law employment practices. So in the absence of the bottom type of law, contract law, in the absence of a uh, employment contract or in the absence of it fitting perfectly into Employment Standards Act, which is statute law, we can take a look at common law standards with respect to, say, for example, termination of employment. So the statute might say a person is entitled to four weeks pay in lieu of notice if they're terminated um, without cause. And common law might say, mm, based upon your circumstances and the way that you were terminated in the, the length of time you were there, you might be entitled to a month or three weeks or, some, or two months worth of pay or notice. And so we look at common law for those things in common. And of course, there's contract law, which is the agreement that exists between two parties. So an employment agreement would fall under contract law. A purchase agreement to buy a house would fall under contract law. A purchase agreement to purchase something in a retail store where there isn't actually a contract there would fall under implied contract law and common law. So you might have certain protections in statute when you purchase something from a vendor. You might have some things that say how it's supposed to be stored or sold or priced or tagged. You might have things in common. Parts of that transaction might be, hey, we all know that you know, if you say it's $5 and you agree upon $5, you can only collect $5 for it. That might be a common law part of the agreement. And then of course, of course there's contract law where things are written down and two parties agree to them. So here's our four different types of law. And when it comes to um, employment standards in Canada, we tend to take a look at whether or not a industry is federally regulated by virtue of the constitution or whether uh, it is provincially regulated. And so um, since we can't list every industry in the world, the Constitution does, in fact, list those industries that are federally regulated. So if you are an employee working for the federal government as a federal government employee for the government of Canada, then, um, of course, that would be federally regulated. But banks are also federally regulated. And so when the government of Canada shuts down for a holiday, all the banks are closed on those holidays, too. This is why sometimes... We have, for example, a provincial holiday where um, everything from schools are closed, but the banks might be open. And we have other days where maybe the schools are open because it's schools are provincially regulated, but the banks are closed that day because it's a federal government holiday. 
And so very often you hear the colloquial term, oh, it's a bank holiday. And what they mean by it's a bank holiday is that it's a federal government, federally regulated holiday, and that all um, industries that are regulated under the Constitution by the federal government of Canada, that they are all closed that day on a holiday. So think about industries that cross borders from province to province and how difficult it would be if you had different laws in one province, or let's take, for example, um, you know, Ottawa and Hull, right across the river from each other in two different provinces with many different laws in province of Quebec, in Ontario and Quebec. Um, and But if it's an industry that is typically going back and forth, like air transportation, marine and shipping, interprovincial railways, telephone, cable, radio, things that the wires and the airwaves and the internet go across borders. Um, grain, we talk about grain elevators because of course grain might only be grown in a couple provinces, but it is intended for the country as a whole. Same thing goes with uranium mining, might um, be mined in a particular province, but there are certain standards about the handling of dangerous uranium that we want to have the same from province to province. We don't want to have a different lower standard as we cross in from one province into another. Protection of fisheries and oceans and natural resources that are affected by anything that goes to the ocean um, is federally regulated. Of course, First Nations agreements and activities that are under agreements with the federal government are federally regulated. Most crown corporations like federal prisons, um, for example, um, the Canadian Radio and Television Communication Commission, another federal agency. Um, these are crown corporations. So they're like businesses that operate separately from the legislature, from the prime minister's office. They operate separately, unlike a department in the federal government and they would be federally regulated. Um, and um, private businesses that are necessary and pretty much only are intended to do something to serve a federal act, those would be federally regulated. I can't even give you an example of one of those. I guess some of those might be um, something to do with uh, maintaining, maintenance and ports. You know, that, that's all they do is maintain or maintenance ports, federal ports. You know, that would be federally regulated. So these banks, marines, airlines, telecommunication companies, when we talk about our telephone company or internet company, um, these are all federally regulated, the same as the federal government is, and everything else is provincially regulated. So this is a pretty short list when you think about the thousands of industries that can exist in equipment and healthcare and education and retail and manufacturing, all of those other industries are provincially re legislated. So if they're not specifically named in the constitution, this list on the right-hand side, then they would become provincially legislated. And this is why we have different legislation like the labor standards legislation in Nova Scotia or the Employment Standards Act in Ontario, or the Employment Standards Code in Alberta. So di slightly different names, but fundamentally the same kinds of rules that exist. So we've got employment agencies and temporary staffing services, now very often referred by governments as TSAs, temporary staffing agencies. They are We are provincially regulated businesses regardless of what industry our client is in. So even though we might be servicing a bank or a railway or a telecommunications company or the federal government itself, that doesn't make us federally regulated. So just because one or some of our customers is regulated by a different jurisdiction or in a different location, doesn't change our jurisdiction. So issues to consider when you
may be misled or make matters seem complicated are things like uh, you want to know which laws apply to you and maybe which laws apply to your customer, and they may be different laws. The, uh, the laws might be different. They might be named similarly, but the laws might be different. Say, for example, your federally regulated customer than the laws that apply to you. An example of that might be that you're provincially regulated and you're in the province of Ontario and um, you're not closed on Remembrance Day, but your customer is federally regulated and you owe, are closed on Remembrance Day. Now, by the way, just to make the point, some provinces, correct me if I'm wrong by anybody who's on the line, but say, for example, I believe Alberta uh, recognizes Remembrance Day as a public holiday. Ontario does not. So if you're in Alberta, you're at home or out somewhere at 11 a.m. when we have a moment of silence. And if you're in Ontario, there's usually a, an announcement at one minute to 11, and there's a moment of silence for students sitting in their in their chairs in their at their desks. So different provinces have different laws and different uh, federal or provincial have different laws. The employee's workplace or assignment location matters too. So normally the location of work of the um, employment agency or temporary staffing service, if it's in, say, for example, Quebec, and they're sending people to go work in Ontario, they fall under Quebec provincial legislation. Just because the customer is in Ontario doesn't change the employer's obligation. So the place of work where an individual is paid, the term is from or through, is where the legislation applies. Um, and they would be deemed to be temporarily working in the other province, but that doesn't change the company's obligation. So they don't have to abide by two different sets of laws, depending upon where the, customer, the employee goes to work that day. Cross-border supply with different provincial legislation, such as public holidays, is an issue. So that's the example that I just give you. Provincial versus um, federal laws or regulations that affect suppliers. Um, this matters. Also, there are often the same laws or similar laws with different details. And sometimes there's laws that exist in a jurisdiction like federal employment equity, there is no, say, for example, Ontario employment equity. Um, things like security, food safety, drug safety. These are all issues that are provincially legislated or, or federally legislated and don't uh, often don't even exist in the province. We also have to consider whether the individual that the laws apply to, um, whether it applies to them at all or whether or not they're an employee of the employer, of the payor, or whether or not they are an independent contractor. So the general rule of thumb is that employers cannot treat employees as if they are not employees um, under the legislation just because they want to. In other words, you can't say to a person, hey, by the way, you're going to, you're going to be an independent contractor we need you to submit an invoice every week. If it looks like an employee, it smells like an employee, acts like an employee, is treated like an employee, then under most provincial legislation, you are in fact an employee. And there are certain rules and standards that exist to make a determination as to whether or not a person is or is not an employee. Sometimes that's very legislated and written into the statute. We're going to get to that in a moment. Um, and sometimes it's a set of common law rules. In other words, the courts, not the legislation, have said, hey, let's take a look at some things. Do you provide your own tools and equipment? Do you have risk of economic loss? Do you have the right to hire? In other words, you could do this job and actually lose money instead of just get paid for the hours that you provide. Um, do you have the right to hire and fire employees to do the work on your behalf? 
Do you have the right to determine the manner in which the work is performed? Are you integrated into the workforce? So do they give you an extension on a phone and give you a business card and a uniform? Uh, or do they not? So there are um, certain things that the courts in common law, if they're not written into the statute, statute law, if they're not in the contract, contract law, they might look at the things that actually exist and use previous common law decisions to determine whether or not you are an, an employee or an independent contractor. So most provinces don't have this rule codified, although Ontario does, um, in their Employment Standards Act, however, the re relevant legislation and regulations rely upon common law determinations to determine whether this Employment Standards Act applies. So I didn't confuse you about that. This is where we would stop and have a conversation about some of your employees and some of your workers. And you would ask me questions about, hey, I've got this person and we treat them as an independent contractor. Is that right? And um, that conversation just ended. So some of the things that minimum uh, employment standards legislation, provincial legislation and federal legislation would cover would be things like hosting and posters and notices and um, employment standards um, guidelines. Um, some provinces specifically say, hey, you have to um, tell people that they're employees. You have to tell people that they're covered under the Employment Standards Act. And you have to give them some information on how they can look up their rights. So did you give them the brochure? Or did you put the poster up in the office? So for example, again, I'm, I'm going to use Ontario just because... Uh, just because Ontario is often some of the most rigorously legislated place. So if it exists in Ontario, it probably exists in your province or will exist in your province. Most things don't start in other provinces and find their way to Ontario. Um, they often start in Ontario and kind of find their way across the province, across the country. Not always. Um, and, um, uh, and lots, the majority of people who uh, tend to be on these training sessions, uh, half or more are from Ontario. So I can't split it up over all 10 provinces. If you want to ask me a question specifically about your province, please do so. If I know the answer about your province, I will. Um, but in most provinces, hours of work, eating periods, rest periods, lunch periods, coffee breaks, holiday breaks, all those things are written in the legislation. The payment of wages, when they have to be paid, how they have to be paid, what information you have to provide people when they're paid is often in the legislation. Things like overtime pay, how you calculate it, when it kicks in are covered in the legislation. So time and a half over 44 hours, for example, in certain provinces, time and a half over 40. I'm going to give you some really unique examples for British Columbia um, in a couple of slides. Types of pay, how do we handle tips and gratuities? Minimum wages are set by the provinces for our industry. Um, the federal government has a minimum wage also. We're going to talk about that uh, again, but I just want to, you know, it's not very often you find a bank or an insurance, a bank, no, insurance companies are provincially legislated, a bank, a railway, a federal government or prison paying people minimum wage. It can happen. Um, but we've got more unionization in federally regulated industries than other industries um, as a percentage of the people working. So very often that gets us pretty far away from minimum wage, but the federal government does have a minimum wage. Each province has their own. I'm going to show you a screen in a moment. Um, things like pregnancy leave and paternal leave are covered under legislation. Don't be confused by, by the way, what an individual is entitled to in unemployment insurance benefits when they're on maternity leave, that's different than that's federally regulated. That benefit is federally regulated. Unemployment insurance is federally regulated or employment insurance as it's called, um, which is different from the rights of an individual to take off time from work and be guaranteed that they get the same or fundamentally similar job back again at the end of their leave. So leaves are provincially regulated. Don't get that confused with what benefit you might get from the federal government while you're off 
on those leaves. So the federal government might say, hey, you're entitled to 18 weeks or 36 weeks or 24 weeks of pay, whereas the government might say, hey, you're entitled to 26 weeks or 12 months of leave. Um, so there's other kinds of leaves, like family caregiver leave in the event that you've got a sick mother, father, or child. Family medical leave. So um, not really sure exactly um, what the wording is that differentiates between a caregiver leave and a medical leave. Um, but a caregiver leave, say, for example, could cover uh, a family member who is um, uh, with dementia and medical leave might be because your kids, you know, got a cold. Uh, critical ill leave, critical illness leave, which is longer term for the individual than medical leave that might go beyond a company's sick day policy. Um, crime child disappearance leave. So there's some pretty um, uh, significant, like I, I can't even remember, I think it might be a year to two years that a parent can take off if their child disappears and, you know, is kidnapped or something. And um, and um, uh, be guaranteed to have their work back. All the public holidays are determined in provincial standards, and each province has different, fundamentally the same, but different public holidays. Um, vacation standards and payment calculations, those are provincially regulated. Hours of work and break, which is kind of like hours of work, point number two over on the other side. Um, termination. Uh, and temporary layoffs. So how much notice do you get? Um, what are the rules about temporary layoff? What happens if you get temporary laid off? When, it becomes a, when does it become a permanent layoff? Severance of employment, which in some provinces is different from termination. Explain that when we get there. Equal pay for equal work. That uh, tends to be gender um, determinations. So that's legislated. Temporary help agencies in some provinces, and particularly in Ontario, have very specific legislation legislating um, THAs. We're going to go through that. Enforcement and compliance of these rules. So this um, screen I update every time I give this presentation gives you an idea of the differences of pay rates for minimum wage in Ontario. Um, if you're ever looking for a quick reference, you can always go to your Employment Standards Act or Labor Code in your province. But uh, I found that this um, Retail Council of Canada does a great job of um, summarizing it and staying up to date um, for each province and also telling you when the next change is going to take place or when the last change took place. So you see, uh, if you have been sent the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you can, that's a clickable link up in the top right-hand corner for the Retail Council of Canada. It'll take you to um, the current rates and changes. So we have things like um, the federal minimum wage. I mentioned to you that each province has their own, but the federal minimum wage is um, got an interesting legislative rule that was passed a while ago. Um, that bases their increases every April on the consumer price index. And the consumer price index is calculated by Statistics Canada. And so it automatic if it's within a certain percentage, you know, like if it's, I don't know, more than a half a percent or something in terms of um, the CPI, the consumer price index for inflation, will determine what the um, minimum standard, the minimum wage standard will be. So for example, as of April, 2023, so nine months ago, the minimum wage was increased to 1665 from 1555. And as you probably remember in 2023, we had some pretty rapid increases in this consumer price index and inflation. And Again, because it goes from April to April, we're looking to April 2024, and inflation didn't really start to decrease until the end, towards the end of uh, 2023. So we're going to see another increase this time, instead of it being a, like a, almost a full dollar from 15.55 as a year ago, it went from 15.55 to 16.65, so almost like 90, 90 cents. Here we're going to see it probably go from 1665 to 1717. So not, you know, so a half a dollar, 
because the interest rate or the inflation rate has declined um, significantly. So that happened automatically because the federal government passed legislation that said that they were going to tie their employment standards um, minimum wage to inflation. So that was a piece of legislation that was passed by the federal government. Every province has either does it ad hoc when they when and if they think it needs to be done or by their own piece of legislation that ties together to something. So Manitoba, for example, has an annual adjustment based upon the consumer price index. But because theirs has smaller thresholds, Manitoba's minimum wage increased from 1530 to 1530 on October 1st, 2023. And that was the second increase in the year. This is a significant increase from 1195. So inflation was so significant that over the course of a year, they um, passed the legislation, then increased it from 1195 um, up until now it's increased to 1530. Saskatchewan's minimum wage increases on a schedule. So it increased from $13 to $14 last October, and it'll go up by another dollar next October. So that example is given to you because in Saskatchewan, they didn't decide in their legislation to tie it to the consumer price index. They decided upon a fixed amount and they put it into their schedule. Now, by the way, Ontario is a good example of a company of a pro province that did that. But when, um, uh, well, I don't know how many years ago, four, five, six years ago, when the Liberal government um, passed a whole bunch of legislation about changes to minimum wage and other changes to the Employment Standards Act, when the Conservative government was elected, they passed legislation to repeal it. So it's a political decision that is often baked into legislation, but as you know, legislation is political and it's decided and voted upon by the people that we elect into power so just because somebody's passed a law doesn't mean if the government changes their circumstances or opinions don't change that it can't change also so how is minimum wage decided it's decided by our legislatures and by our elected politicians how often is it up updated it depends some do it on a schedule because their legislation says so. Some do it at a fixed amount. Some do it according to the consumer price index because their legislation says so. And some just wait until there's enough political power, pressure, and public opinion that they seem they need to increase it. What are some of the implications of higher or lower wage, minimum wage? Everybody's got an opinion about it. Every um, statistician and economist who wants to prove point, uses different statistics to make prove their point. The reality is this, that over time, it's believed that minimum wage increases um, impact the lowest wage people the most and higher wage people less, and that there's a diminishing effect as you move higher than the minimum wage. In other words, if say the minimum wage is $15 and it increases to 16, it obviously affects the people at $15 an hour. But what about the people who used to make $16 an hour? Does the employer keep their wage the same and let all the other people now come up to their wage? Or do they now start to increase the $16 people a little bit? Well, history has kind of proven that the $16 people don't go up by as much on a percentage basis. So the $16 people might go up to $16.50. Well, what about the people at 1650? Do they go up? Do they remain the same at 1650 or do they go up to 1675? And so as we move away from the absolute minimum, the changes to minimum wage seem to have less and less of an impact on the other higher wage earners. We tend to see that minimum wage in some jurisdictions and in some places can have a marginal effect on inflation. So if we increase some people's wages, then companies have to increase their rates that they charge 
to help compensate for those wages. Um, but there's not overwhelming evidence that minimum wage increases have significant impact. Again, it's diminishing because if wages only represent two or five or ten percent of the input costs um, in the sale of goods and services, and it so a small percentage of the goods and service, and if only a small percentage of the people working are down at minimum wage, then you know a 5% increase in minimum wage might only have an infinitely small impact on the price of the widget that's being sold because wages only represented 10% of the cost of the widget in the first place and only 5% of the people who build the widgets uh, were at minimum wage. And so, you know, it's like 5% times 10%, which is 0.05% increase in the cost of the widget. So different people have different opinions. Generally, um, industries want to keep minimum wage down because it does have a trickle effect through everybody's wages. Generally, unions and advocacy groups and lower wage people want more increases in minimum wage. And the politicians fight it out to determine who has the most impact on their electability to determine whether or not minimum wage will increase or remain the same. So we've got uh, off of minimum wage now. I have payroll requirements. So on payroll legislation, uh, I'm going to take a stop for a second. It's um, shortly after two. We're going to take a break at two thirty. Start at twelve, or sorry, at one thirty, an hour and a half in, and then we'll take a fifteen minute break or a ten minute break and come back until four o'clock. Payroll requirements uh, typically cover pay periods. They cover things like direct deposit. So for example, if you put somebody on direct deposit, it can't be in their sister's name or their mother's name, it has to be in their name. They have to receive some kind of statements, which we call stub legislation. So they either have to receive a paper stub or they have to receive an email or they have to have some kind of portal that they can log in to see how the pay was calculated. Um, court orders are the only way that we can have non-legislated uh, deductions from a person's pay. So if you get a garnishment of wages from a court, um, but you can't just turn around and take money off people's pay stubs um, off of their pay um, unless they are legislated statutory deductions. So we have to withhold tax CPPEI and um, it can be agreed upon things like union deductions. And of course, vacation pay must be separately stipulated on their pay. So we can't say, oh, we made... Uh, $20.80 an hour and just assume that they know that 20 of it is um, standard wage and 80 cents is 4% vacation pay. They have to be separately identified and paid separately on their pay stub. Um, there, if there are other pay deductions, there have to be written authorizations, which can be in the form of a union agreement or something. So you might say, hey, I want to have... Um, a certain amount of money deducted from my pay to go towards my RSPs. You can sign to do that, but they have to be agreed upon in advance and you have, must have the right to be able to change it. So it can't be something like a penalty where the employer says, oh, we're taking this off of your check because of something. It has to be agreed upon and authorized in advance. It must stipulate the calculation method and the frequency, um, and it can never cover things like faulty work. So make this one up. So a temporary help agency could not say to somebody, hey, our client didn't like your performance at the assignment and they've terminated it. Uh, we have to give them four hours free. So we're not going to pay you or we're going to deduct it from your pay sub. You can't do that kind of stuff. It's against the law. Now, in some provinces, things like cash shortages can be deducted from a person's pay, but only in very specific circumstances. So for example, if it, um, a person who comes in at nighttime to operate a cash uh, cashier and they sign out their cash box. So they go over and they get their cash box and it's got a float in it of $400 and they count it, say, yes, there is $400, and they sign for it, and they take their 400 cash box. The last employee takes their cash box out, puts it away, signs it out, and balances it. Then that person goes in, and nobody has access to that cash box other than employee. Then you can have certain agreements that says, hey, we handed you money, now bring the money back. 
you can have those kinds of agreements. They're very rare and they typically um, are in very limited circumstances. So for example, in a restaurant, you would have difficulty doing that because the numbers of people who have got access to run things through the cash, get change, make change, that kind of stuff. Um, special legislation in Ontario and other provinces kind of follow in common law if it's not in their legislation. A temporary uh, employment agency cannot charge a fee to a worker or make payroll deductions. Um, you can't charge them for helping them find a job. You can't charge them for helping them do the resume. You can't charge them for presenting their resume to an employer. You can't charge them a percentage of the fee that you charge the employer um, totally against the law. Uh, you can't give them, uh, charge them for giving them information or advice. Um, if special employment terms exist concerning the employee's uh, recruitment to purchase items such as a uniform or safety equipment, that can be agreed upon in advance if you've got like a tuck shop and they can buy their uniforms from you. I strongly recommend that as a temporary staffing agency, you don't do that. I strongly recommend that you treat it as an entirely separate thing. Say, for example, they can go online to your portal and purchase, you know, their uniform and not treat it as a as a payroll deduction um, that they can go into the um, the store and buy their lunch that you don't give them their lunch and treat it as a payroll deduction. Those things are just a setup for disaster because they're almost impossible to administer in a manner that the courts will accept. Hours of work with weekly limits. Ontario has a maximum number of work um, hours um, in a day. They've got a maximum number of workers in a week. Um, they've got overtime hours. Alberta's maximum number of hours um, is a little bit different. So for example, um, you can't require by law that a person work more than eight hours in Ontario, but you can have an employment agreement where they agree separately to do that, but it has to be agreed in advance. So if you say, hey, um, you know, you're, uh, you've got an eight hour shift and you're hired for eight hours, and then you turn around and say to them, you must work 12 today. We've got something, you have to work 12. The employee could say no. And if you fired them, you'd be in violation of the law. If you tell them they must, it doesn't mean they won't agree to it. it. Doesn't mean that. And there's also provisions for emergencies, so you can, you know, you've had a fire, flood, theft, uh, someone sick. Um, you can require them to work 12 hours temporarily, but you can't just arbitrarily change their employment agreement. Um, and in Ontario, the rule is 48 hours per week, and then of course there's the super rule of 60 hours a week in Ontario. Um, there's some interesting things about um, free time. So an employee must receive 11 consecutive hours off each day. Um, but there's only eight hours off in between shifts. So they're talking about a calendar day. So that's midnight. So you have to give them eight hours off from the um, end of their last shift. So if they finished at midnight, you couldn't bring them back till eight in the morning. But if they finished at midnight, they had no time off. No, they had time off. Um, so they worked an eight hour shift, you know, that finished at midnight. Well, they had all their time off on the previous day before, you know, six o'clock in the afternoon or whatever the time they started their shift at or four o'clock in the afternoon. So they had their 11 hours off. Um, uh, consecutively before the shift. So it gets a little confusing, but they have to have eight hours in between shifts and 11 accumulated hours off in a calendar day. And it's hard to think of examples where that fit, but it typically fits into shift workers. Um, and they have to have one 24 consecutive hour um, day off per week. So that's, you know, Saturdays or Sundays off. Most of us, you don't have two days off per week, um, but the law only requires one. 
And in some provinces, they will say, hey, you can have two weeks on and then two days off. So three weeks on and three days off, four weeks on, then four days off. So that's more typical, say, for example, in Alberta. And those laws exist particularly because of people who go into camp. So they go off site to work. Um, uh, so they might go into camp for two weeks and have two days off uh, in a row, which is one day to represent the first week and one day to represent the, so that's the last week of the two week period and the first day of the next two week period or two days from the two week period. Um, so this is called um, hours averaging and bundled hours. So again, uh, same thing as before, 11 consecutive hours off in each day, eight hours off in between shift, 24 hours at least once a week. And so these days of rest, these vacation uh, days, days off. Um, so one day a week. So this is the Alberta example I gave you. Two days every two weeks, three days every three weeks, four days every four weeks. So that basically is one day per week, but because of the notion of going into camp and working where they might fly you in instead of having to fly you back and fly you in and fly you back, um, they've got special legislation that handles that sort of thing. Um, overtime rules can be a little bit confusing from province to province. Ontario is pretty straightforward. You know, anything worked over 44 hours in a calendar week, you have to stipulate when your weekends, when it begins, you can't change it. To accommodate your hours um so if it's saturday midnight to saturday midnight that's your that's your week 44 hours is the time you can um they've changed some of the rules around so if an employee works as a manager for 50 percent of their time managers are not entitled to overtime pay uh, under the legislation so if you take one of your employees and say hey will you come in on saturday and act as the manager um in ontario um, they have to work more than 50% of their time. They did have to work more than 50% of their time in order for that rule to even kick in. And nowadays, um, you under Bill 148 in Ontario, you can't give a person some management shift, but they normally work as a non-manager. So now in Ontario under Bill 148, if you work any shifts as a non-manager, you're a non-manager entitled to um, overtime. Um, so again, a rule that was in place um, prior that said you had to have more than 50% to lose your management rights. And then the liberal government, before they lost their last election, introduced Bill 148 and said, no, 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 no. If you're not a manager, you're not a manager. You can't call them a manager for shift. So legislation changes. BC rules are really kind of interesting. Um, BC has an eight hour a day rule. So if you work more than eight hours a day, you're entitled to overtime on that day. And um, if you work more than a certain number of hours a week, you're entitled to overtime in the week, 40 hours. But they have a, a second tier. So if you work more than eight hours a day, you're entitled to 1.5. Um, time and a half. If you work more than 12 hours in a day, you're entitled to double time for the excess hours. So this can get confusing for payroll systems, timesheet management. So if you're in British Columbia, take a look at this one. If this employee works 37 hours in the week, which does not get them over the 40 hour limit, and they did it like this. On Monday, they worked eight hours, so they got regular pay. On Tuesday, they worked 10 hours, so they worked two hours in excess of eight. So they got eight hours of regular pay and two hours of overtime. And on Wednesday, they only work six hours. So that's regular time. But on Thursday, they work 13 hours. So they had a total of 37. But on Thursday, eight hours of regular time, four hours of time and a half, and one hour at double time because it's over 12 hours. So this one, if you can see my mouse, this one is the one hour over 12 hours. These are the four over eight, and there's your eight. So here we've got an individual who picked up six hours at time and a half, one hour at double time, 
and these other hours, 8, 14, 30 hours, they've got, you know, 24, 30 hours at regular time. So this can be very complicated for payroll systems. Temporary help companies very often don't talk to their customers about this. They just see 37 hours and they pay the same person for 37 hours. So you can have some very complicated payroll rules around overtime and statutory holiday calculations and other things. And quite honestly, very often the even the worker doesn't understand their um, rights in these things. So this is why they have the poster requirement to post things so that at least employees can look it up on their own. So we've got minimum hour rules in certain provinces. Some it's three, some it's four, some it's two. Um, and so this means that you can't require an employee to come to work for less than, say, for example, in Alberta, three hours. It's not worth the person's time to come to work. It doesn't mean that a person can't it doesn't mean that a person can't accept a two-hour shift. They can. But you can't require a person to come to work for less than three hours. And you certainly can't reprise against a person. In other words, fire them or not hire them because they only want two-hour shifts. So um, the law says that um, you can't penalize somebody, build it into their standard schedule, or make your hiring requirements upon people who hiring and firing requirements upon people who work less than three hours. In other words, hey, man, it takes a lot of effort to get up, get to work, drive there, get back, set it for um, three hours. In minimum three-hour shifts or minimum or two hours if pay rate is above minimum. So in Alberta, sorry, I um, said that wrong. So if you're a minimum wage worker, you're entitled to a three-hour shift. If you're more than a minimum wage hour worker, you're entitled to a two-hour shift in Ontario, in Alberta. In Ontario, it's three hours. The un Liberal government is six years ago, passed Bill 148 and increased it to four. Then the Conservative government was elected and they repealed it and put it back to three. So some of uh, employers, like one of my companies, I own a home care company with hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of uh, nurses and PSWs. Um, our employment contracts used to say three and they changed the legislation to our employment contracts and our handbook and so on went to four and then they changed it back again. Well, we're a good employer and we never really work people for less than four hours anyways, but we didn't put it back our policy or our rules back to three again because during the seven months that this existed, it became sort of the law of the land around our company that we would never ask anybody to go look after someone for less than four hours. So it's difficult. It's easy to give people things. It's difficult to take it away. But the legislation um, temporarily existed for four hours, then was repealed back to three. Of course, British Columbia, as seen here, is two hours. Uh, all, I'm not going to get into the details about um, young workers, but every province in the country has got special rules about young people and they can be whether they're allowed to work at all. <clears throat> they can be whether or not they're allowed to work in certain industries. They can be about what hours of work they can work. They can deal with minimum wage. So for example, in Manitoba, young people, 13, 14, 15 um, years of age cannot work in regular employment jobs. Um, they can't work on construction sites, drilling service rigs. They can't work over certain heights. They can't work with pesticides and herbicides. They can't work in manufacturing, scaffolding, pruning. Uh, and they can't work without adult supervision. So you can, say, for example, ask them to work as a dishwasher. But you can ask them to work in some of these areas that are listed here. Every province has got different rules. So if you're in the biz of hiring young people, take a look at what um, rules and regulations apply to you. Uh, equal pay violations. An employer cannot pay one employee at a rate of pay less than another employee on the basis of sex when they perform substantially the same kind of work in the same establishments. So equal pay is not pay equity. Um, 
equal pay says. There's a, I think maybe the next screen, yeah. Takes us to this elaborate sort of obvious sort of checklist. If you've got um, a difference in pay between two different people, then we have to, uh, if it's the same, then what's the issue? We don't have to worry about it. If it's different, if the answer is yes, then we go to the next question. Is there a difference in the sex uh, or employment status? So are they part-time workers, full-time workers, or are they male or female? And if the answer is yes, the some workers are male, some are female, and they get paid differently, then we have to go on to the next question. Are the employees required to perform the same kind of work? So they might have the same title, but substantially different work, then it's okay to have different pay weights for different work. But if the work is the same, they're supposed to have the same rate. Is it at the same place of work? Is it the same establishment? Is one going out way out in the country and the other one doing it right to downtown? We're allowed to have different pay rates for different establishments. Um, do they use substantially the same skills to do their job? So in other words, do we use the same hiring criteria or do we have lower hiring criteria in one area than we do in another? Do they use substantially the same responsibilities in their jobs? So are they measured and evaluated and have the same responsibilities in the job? If the answer is all things are the same, we are not supposed to have different rates. If the answers are different place, different rules, different locations, different standards, then we can have different pay rates. Is the difference in pay for substantially the same jobs due to a seniority system? So if you get a different a pay rate at the end of two years and five years, that's allowed. A merit system, have you reached the you know, million dollar sales club? Have you answered a thousand phone calls? Did you place a million bricks? Um, is there some sort of merit system? Have you got some sort of scoring mechanism? If there's other factors that are different from sex and employment status, um, part-time or full-time, then you can have different pay rates. But if you go through all of these questions, same job, same expectations, same hiring criteria, same measurement criteria, then it's just against the law to have different pay rates. Um, what almost happened in Ontario in 2019? So, 18. Uh, equal pay legislation. So, again, this was another piece of legislation passed by one government, then repealed by the next government. Thankfully, this legislation had a long horizon. In other words, when they passed the legislation, they said it doesn't take effect until after the um, election. And then when they lost the election, the new government came in and repealed it right away. And basically, this one said Ontario employees were entitled to equal pay regardless of their employment status, example, full-time, part-time, casual, et cetera. But it also said that Ontario employees from temporary help agencies were entitled to the exact same or equal pay to the permanent employees. So that would have meant that every time you hired a temp to go work to replace a full-time worker, you would have had to say to the customer, what's the pay rate of your full-time worker? And they go, oh, it's uh, $50 an hour. Then you would have said, oh, okay, I got to pay my temp, uh, temporary agency worker $50 an hour and then figured out your markup. And of course, all those rules that I just read to you about, did they have the same seniority? Did they do the same hiring criteria? Are they measured in the same way? Do they have the same, um, you know, standards? would all have been different, but this legislation was intended to blow that away and say that if you work for ABC Temporary Staffing Service, you must be paid the same as XYZ customer. Um, that would have been a nightmare. It would have been a nightmare from a marketing perspective, from a business practices perspective, from an information accuracy perspective. So that was repealed. Um, we can have written agreements um, for temporary employees, employees and staffing firms um, that have exceptions to the laws. Um, for example, you can have an exception to um, 44 hours a week. You can say, hey, our payroll is 
um, every two weeks. And uh, most of our customers are in hospitals and they've got 12 hour shifts. So you can make an application to the to the province and say, hey, can we do hours averaging? Can we have 88 hours overtime over a two week pay period? So long as it's every two weeks and we don't alternate when the weeks begin and end and so on because of these reasons. And usually the provincial director of employment standards can give to have some slight changes, but they need to be justifiable and they typically need to be written. And then there's some industries. So say, for example, my home care business is in the healthcare business in Ontario. So it automatically allows us to do two weeks hours averaging because there isn't a hospital in Ontario that isn't unionized and doesn't have 12 hour shifts. So, you know, we automatically apply for that hours averaging exception. So these hours averaging agreements exist in, in Ontario and in Alberta and other provinces. Um, and again, you can look for hours averaging or compressed in Alberta. They call it the compressed work week. Um, and in Ontario, they call it hours averaging. Um, in BC, hours averaging agreements um, must be in writing. Uh, pretty much all provinces. They got to be in writing. You have to indicate the schedule for each day. They have to specify the start and end date of the agreement. So the agreement can't last forever. You have to say every two years, say we're going to have a new hours averaging agreement with our employees. Um, we have to um, indicate whether or not this agreement can be repeated once or twice or three times, whether it's for three months, six months, 12 months, and repeated for three months. And we have to ensure that there's signatures on this before, not after. Just a quick point on lunch breaks. Most provinces say how many hours uh, um, <clears throat> a person is limited to work before they are entitled to have a lunch break. So usually say, for example, on an eight hour shift, you have one lunch break. That's because if you went from eight to say one, five hours, you need to have a lunch break before 1 p.m. Then the afternoon is from two to four or two to five. That's only three hours. So they're not entitled to another break in the afternoon, but they must have one break every five hours for an eating break or a lunch break. Um, most provinces don't have coffee breaks written into the legislation. So coffee breaks that when you say, oh, you're entitled to a, an hour lunch and two 15 minute, um, two 15 minute coffee breaks. Well, that's usually a company policy. That's usually not in the legislation because these coffee breaks are not typically legislated. Um, vacation entitlements. So vacation entitlements are almost always tied to tenure and the amount of time that a person has worked. I get eight more minutes before we take our first break. So if I go over somebody unmute and yell at me, I have a tendency to not look at the clock. Um, so vacation breaks are tend to be based upon tenure. So, um, and in some provinces like Ontario, I'm sorry if you're not from Ontario, I feel obnoxious repeating the name Ontario over and over and over again. Um, but like Ontario, once you've worked for the same employer for five years or longer, you are uh, completed five full years, then you automatically entitled to three weeks vacation or 6% vacation pay. Um, vacation pay always defaults to time off with pay. However, you can have signed agreements that will allow you to pay the vacation pay monetarily on each paycheck. Typically, this is done by temporary staffing companies, agencies, because people come and people go. And, um, you know, I'll give you an example. One time, many, many de decades ago, bought a fairly large light industrial company in Oakville, Ontario. And that company had a vacation policy to follow the legislation to accrue the vacation and put it into a fund or hold it. And they would tell employees, oh, you've got $400 in your fund, or you got $500 in your fund. And when they took the vacation, they would say, I want the equivalent of one week's pay or two weeks pay or all my pay. And they could request their vacation payment. But of course, 
temporary workers come and go and they don't pay attention and they go to jail and they leave the province and they get a full-time job and they forget. And so when we bought this company, we found that they owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in unpaid vacation pay because the companies had accrued it, but the employees departed before they took their vacation and when they just disappeared. It's not like they said, I'm taking vacation or I quit. They just weren't available or weren't offered another assignment for a while, then found another job. Those vacation pays were not paid out. So the temporary staffing agency or temporary staffing business can get a little bit of a black mark on their face if they accrue vacation. They don't have a rigorous set of policies and practices to disperse that money in a regular basis. And theoretically, that has to go on your books and it has to be reported to Revenue Canada. And it has to be, if not paid out, it's supposed to be in Ontario. Nobody does this. Given to the province to hold on to until you can find these people to give it to them. So you're not supposed to even be able to hold on to it. But of course, em dirty employers don't do that. Unwitting and unknowledgeable employers don't do that. And so um, typically when employment ends, we're supposed to pay out all outstanding vacation. And the simplest way to temporary staffing services is to have an agreement up front when we hire the people to have them agree to receive their four or six vacation pay on each paycheck. And again, as mentioned earlier, separately identified, separately calculated, separately reported on their stubs, not bundled into their pay rate. So, geez, uh, I don't know if we need to go through examples of how you calculate this, but a temporary employee has worked less than five years. Um, so therefore they're entitled to 4% vacation pay of their gross earned wages in the 12 month vacation entitlement period or stub period. Um, Susan works part-time and earns $16,000 in vacation entitlement. She's entitled to 4% of $16,000 in vacation pay, which is uh, $640. Um, of course, we don't need to pay vacation pay on vacation pay. So if we pay the person their $640, we don't have to add 4% on top of that. It's just 4%. Um, can I ask a quick question? Sure, of course. Um, if we have an employee that has worked a regular week, but for whatever reason in their personal lives, they've requested to, you know, say pull out two, three hundred dollars worth of vacation pay, but there has been no time off in that pay period. Is that acceptable? Is that okay? And just FYI, we're Ontario based. Yeah, uh, good question. Thank you. There's no specific law that um, restricts a person from taking their vacation pay uh, without vacation, without actually taking the vacation. However, um, you are obligated to give them that accrued time off, but it would be kind of, it would that would be tantamount to or exactly the same as having the person sign an agreement that says, hey, give me my 4% vacation pay on every check. Uh, and so when they take their time off, they're not entitled to any more pay because they've already received it. Um, so the long answer is there's nothing stopping them to do that. I think it's a bad business practice, although it's not necessarily a bad business practice. If you're like, you know, understanding they're going to lose their house or miss their car payment or their kids can't eat or something, like, you know, like we all use our discretion. Um, but if they asked for time off, you couldn't punish them or reprise against them. So if they came back a month and a half later and say, I'd like to take my vacation, they have no money left in their accrual, or maybe they've got a hundred bucks in there or $200 because it's only started to accrue from the last time you paid them till now. Um, you can't refuse to give them the time off because they've got no accrual. In other words, they're not linked together. Perfect. They're still okay. two weeks off. Yeah, right. So make sure that, you know, if you do that, you still track how many days they're eligible for. Correct. Got it. So the, their eligibility of pay and the fact they took their pay didn't undermine their eligibility to have the actual time off. Did I say that right? Did it make sense? Yeah. 
hope so. Okay, good question. Yep. That's great. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks for jumping in there. That says that you guys are still awake. I totally appreciate it. Okay, listen, it's um 229. We're gonna try to finish at four o'clock. I'm a little behind schedule. We're gonna take a 10 minute break um for you to answer phone, nature break, get a drink, fill up your coffee mug. Do me a favor, do not leave the meeting and try to come back. Just um Keep your microphone off. Turn your camera off. It's 2.29 now. Please come back at 2.40. I'm going to start at 2.40 on the button, whether you're here or not. I'm going to freeze the screen here um, and my microphone while I go get my coffee. And I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Thanks. Uh, Whitney, if you'll just uh, unclick and let me confirm for me that uh, my volume is okay and you can hear me. Is that... Uh... Yeah. You're perfect. perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to talk about statutory holidays, which can be a little bit of a confusing issue, particularly those people who are on a border of provincial borders. And for those people who are um, supplying people to federally regulated industries, it's not actually that confusing, but it, you can think it's confusing. Um, so first off, a temporary employee, uh, each province uh, designates what their public holidays are going to be. So, for example, in some provinces, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, New Year's Day, <clears throat> uh, Family Day in February, um, Good Friday at Easter, um, uh, Victoria Day in May, Canada Day in July. There's this odd one, the civic holiday that takes place in some places uh, on the 1st of August. Um, we've got Labor Day in September and then Thanksgiving Day in October. And then, of course, uh, then we roll into um, Christmas, Boxing and New Year's Day. Not every one of those days is a public holiday in every province. Uh, St. Jean Baptiste Day in Quebec, but not Victoria Day in Quebec. Um, then the, uh, Remembrance Day in Alberta, but not in Ontario. So we've got different uh, days and the federal government has their list of days, which don't necessarily always map out with the provinces. But a person who um, uh, is provincially regular, whatever the regulation is entitled to the day off with pay. Pay is calculated as a average day's pay. So this applies to all temporary workers also. So if they're on a temporary assignment, with, but not going out to work for the customer that day, they're entitled to the day off with pay. Um, alternatively, they can, they can agree in writing to work on the holiday at a regular rate, and then they get an alternative day off, say the following Monday, off with pay so that they get exactly the same thing, but they've agreed in advance. It's not something you can drop on them the day before the holiday. It has to be something that is agreed to in advance, and they're not obligated to unless it's in their standard employment agreement that that's the, what's going to happen on those days off. Um, so this is called a substitute day for them. And uh, let me just move on to this. There's this weird holiday. Uh, it's not so weird in some, I'm not sure which province it is. I think maybe um, the federal government for sure. I think maybe Saskatchewan. There's some provinces that have got a, what's called the civic holiday which is um, the first day of August. Um, it's not a statutory holiday in many provinces, but um, many provinces, it's the standard policy inside a company to give people that day off with pay anyways. So theoretically, staffing services are not obliged to give that day off. And they're also not obliged, to, if they do give that day off, to give a paid day for it. So some temporary staffing companies say, well, you know, you don't have an assignment that day because the customer's closed down. So you're not working that day. That's in your schedule. And you're not going to get paid for that day. So this is really when it comes to the civic holiday in provinces or jurisdictions where it's not listed as a public holiday is up to the company to have a policy for it. But this is also why um, Boxing Day, for example, in some provinces is not a public holiday, where, for example, in Ontario, it is a paid public holiday. 
this explains why. So let's just take, um, you know, Boxing Day. And so you've got Boxing Day sales and a whole bunch of retail stores that are open uh, in a province like Ontario, where Boxing Day is a paid public holiday. Those workers are either getting a time and a half for working on that day. So in effect, it's double. We've heard the term double time and a half. So in effect, it's double time and a half because they're receiving time and a half for working on the day and they're receiving their paid holiday as if they had taken the day off. So this is where there's no such thing in the legislation called double time and a half. But if they always work eight hours a day and they're going to get paid eight hours to stay at home, but they're asked to work, they still get the eight hours for staying at home. Then they get paid time and a half for going to work on that day. So that's your double time and a half. So double time and a half is an expression that people use to say how they're going to get paid for working on the holiday. Or for those people working in that the electronic store on the public holiday, they may be told that they're going to get a different day off. So they might get, say, for example, New Year's Eve, which is not a public holiday anywhere. They might be said, hey, on New Year on December 31st, you get that day off with pay and you get time, uh, you get um, um, uh, work on the holiday, but that has to be agreed in advance that they're going to work the holiday and get a paid day off later on down the road. So some companies try to use the um, alternative day off um, in an effort to try to save money so they're not paying premium rates on the day that people work. There's um, been some changes in different provinces on how you calculate that regular day's pay. Ontario, again, um, it used to be that they had very vague language about um, how it was calculated. Then they came up with this divide by 20 rule. Then the province came along. Again, same thing. It was the Liberal government prior to them losing the last election. And Bill 148 changed the law. So they said it was the average hours of the previous pay period divided by the number of days they worked. So if a person worked two days in the previous pay period, then you would take their 16 hours divided by two because they only worked two days and then pay them eight hours for their time, their public holiday when they only ever worked 16 hours a week. And so it was causing employers a huge cost more than just their average day's pay. So then the conservative government came back in and put it back to divide by 20, which we call the simplified rule. And basically, uh, and you could probably get away with doing the same calculation in other provinces. Um, basically what they say is take the um, total amount of gross earnings, not vacation pay, in the previous 30 day calendar days preceding the holiday, Divide that by 20, which is four weeks, five days a week. So that's 20 days. So divide it by 20. And so if the average work week is five days a week, and you took that what they totally earned in the previous. So if they only worked one day in the prior month, they're going to get one twentieth of one day's pay on the vacation, on the public holiday, which is um, in proportion to one day's pay because they normally don't work on all those days. So um, uh, in Ontario, we've got this divide by 20. In Manitoba, it's average pay in the prior month. So how you calculate average pay, uh, you know, it's not stipulated in the law. They just say the an average day's pay. So Ontario put it into the legislation on how you were going to calculate your average day's pay. So in this particular case, Megan uh, ends a six-month assignment on May the 26th. And Canada, Canada Day is five weeks later on July the 1st. And Megan earns $15 an hour. She was available to work on May the 30th but did not get offered another assignment between May 30th and July the 1st. So the, the importance of the significance 
of May the 30th is that she was available to work on what might have been a regular scheduled day immediately following a holiday or immediately before or after a holiday. Um, but she wasn't she was regularly scheduled. So five weeks go by and she earns nothing. So when we come along to the July 1st holiday, we take everything she earned in the month of June in the 30 days immediately preceding, which is zero. We divide it by 20, so she gets zero. She was still employed by us because we did not effectively terminate her employment and she didn't quit. So she was just not regularly scheduled and earned zero income. But um, Erna, she works the four weeks in June prior to the Canada Day public holiday for total regular wages are calculated at $120 a day for five days. So she earned $600 a week. During those four weeks, she earned $2,400. So we take Erna's $2,400 and we divide it by 20, and we come up with $120 in pay, which is her regular day's pay. Now, that's an obvious one to see because she always earned $120. But what if she worked six hours one day, 10 hours the next day, six hours one day, 10 hours the next day? You know, still may have worked out to be exactly $120 or may not have been. She may have taken some days off without pay. And so that may have affected her $120. She may have worked some overtime, which would have affected her $120. So in Erna's case, she did earn wages in the four weeks immediately preceding. So Manitoba public holiday pay, employee who consistently works the same number of hours, gets one regular day pay for a general holiday. So for example, if the person always works eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, they'd get their regular eight hours on the public holiday. So they don't, talk about an average they say if you work a regular schedule and you get that which means that if you took a day off it doesn't affect your eight hours so in ontario if you took a day off without pay it brought your total earnings down when we divided it by 20 but in manitoba they say no if you have a regular scheduled eight hours a day and you actually just took a day or two days off or were sick or without pay or something in the previous month, it doesn't affect your eight hours. So they've got slightly different wording. Um, for employees, your hours uh, vary, then the um, holiday is calculated at 5% of their gross wages, not including overtime in the four weeks preceding. Well, 5% is the same as dividing by 20. It's the exact same number, just calculated differently. Right? So um, if we took 5% of 100, you know, 5% um, uh, of 1,000, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, going to get the same as taking the $1,000 and divide it by 20. So um, it works out to be exactly the same, different word. Jordan ends a six-month assignment on a Friday, February the 17th. He'd been earning $800 a week while on that assignment. Family day falls on Monday, February the 20th. So he ends his assignment just before family day, which in the province he's in is a public holiday. He's offered another assignment that begins one week after family day on February the 27th, but he was not scheduled to work during the week of family day. So here we've got an employee who worked before the holiday, so therefore qualified, was not scheduled to work immediately following the holiday, but was scheduled to work a week after that. If Jordan shows up for work on Monday the 27th, then Jordan will have worked his regularly scheduled workday on the day before the holiday, which was the Friday before, and on Monday the 27th, which is his regularly scheduled workday after the holiday, because he was, did not have regularly scheduled work. Had he been scheduled to work on the Monday, Tuesday after the holiday and not shown up, that would have been different. 
because in most provinces, you have to work on your regularly scheduled day immediately before and after the holiday. But in this weird circumstance, his next regularly scheduled day wasn't until a week later. So technically, when Jordan goes back to work a week later, he's going to get his pay plus his public holiday pay. The $3,200 divided by 20 or in Manitoba times 5%. This is something that almost no temporary help companies do properly because they only take a look at the people who were regular, supposed to work on the holiday, took the day off the holiday, so they pay them for the holiday to stay home. But if they weren't scheduled to work till the next week, they didn't pay it to them. So this is a vulnerability for companies that don't do it correctly who um, might get audited for um, employment standards audit. So he earned $800 a week in the four weeks before it's $3,200, $3,200 divided by 20 or 5% is 160 bucks a day. So the public holiday pay is $620, is $160. If he accrues and accumulates vacation pay, then additional um, $6.40 will go into his vacation account. If he takes vacation pay on every check, then he'll get $160 plus $6.40 $6 on that check. So if you're accumulating vacation pay and putting it into account, then his $6.40 will go into the account. Because remember, this is not a vacation day. You don't pay vacation pay on vacation pay, but you do pay vacation pay on public holiday pay. So we talked a little bit before about premium pay, uh, one and a half times if you worked on the holiday. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, okay, let's talk about termination of assignment. So termination of an assignment under employment standards is different from termination of employment. When an assignment, it occurs when an assignment employee has an assignment termination yet remains employed with the temporary help agency. So the, the customer might call and say, hey, we don't need this temp anymore, this temporary staffing worker anymore. We're going to terminate the assignment on Friday. So if you don't give the person written notice of termination of employment, they're deemed to be, and you don't give them a new assignment, they're deemed to be in temporary layoff or inactive just like the worker before I told you, who was a regular worker, just not with scheduled time to work. So an agency is required to provide either one week's written notice of pay in lieu of or in combination of pay and time if we decide to terminate this employee's employment. So what does this mean? It means that when a worker is terminated from assignment, if we haven't given them at least one week's notice and we do nothing, then they're in layoff and potentially are going to go back to work or are potentially someday going to be deemed to be terminated. So in other words, if we never call them again, at some point in time, they could say, hey, wait a minute, I think you terminated me. I'm entitled to my termination pay. So the notion of temporary workers being in what we refer to as continuity of employment between assignments has become a real thing over the last 15 or 20 years. And particularly some elected governments have tried to make a real issue out of it so that employees are still entitled to some notice of termination if their assignment ends we didn't officially terminate them with notice. Now, by the way, you can give people notice. So if you have an assignment with a temporary worker and their assignment is supposed to end on February the 28th, is this a leap here? February the 29th. If it's supposed to end on February the 29th, and we knew when we gave them the assignment three months ago that it was supposed to end on February the 29th, 
we tell them your assignment is from now until February the 29th. And you're given notice that your assignment is terminating on February the 29th. And if a week or two weeks before the um, the February the 29th, we send them a reminder saying, this is just to remind you that your assignment and your employment will terminate it on February the 29th, then you're good. Give them a record of employment when they're done. Tell them, tell Revenue Canada and no Services Canada, there was a shortage of work. Um, you don't owe them any more money because under employment standards, you need to give people notice of termination. And in the absence of notice, you can give them money. You can give them pay in lieu of notice. And if you fail to give them some kind of all of their notice, you can say, hey, but I need you to work. I'm giving you one week's notice. I need you to work three of those days, but I'll pay you for five. That's okay, too. So in some provinces, most provinces, you can give some combination of notice, pay in lieu of notice, or a combination of pay and lieu of notice, so long as it adds up to the notice period. So what we end up doing in the temporary help world is we end up forgetting to treat people, even if we want to, sometimes we don't want to, to treat people at the that they're the end of their employment when they're at the end of their assignment. So if you're like me and my home care company and I have hundreds of nurses and hundreds of caregivers and they work for two weeks and then they're off for five days and I don't know when they're going to work again, but they go back on for four weeks and then they're off for seven days and then I don't know when they're going to go back to work again because in the home and healthcare business, you know, our business depends upon people being healthy and being sick and whether nurses show up or don't show up for COVID and all kinds of things. So we don't terminate our employees every time it, it ends because we're pretty darn confident that if they're good enough to work for us, we're going to get them back to work before 13 weeks passes, which would be the effective date when a layoff transfers or changes into a termination. And so we don't terminate them because we want them to work for us again. And we don't want to take the risk of saying you're terminated, oh, you're hired, oh, you're terminated, you're hired. And quite frankly, if Re if Services Canada, no, if em employment standards uh, um, looked at um, a termination, a week later start, termination, a week later start, after two or three of those, they'd say, nah, you're not really terminating these people. And they wouldn't recognize it anyways. So your big risk is in those people who work on an assignment that is, say, a maternity leave or a project. And the likelihood of you actually putting that person out again immediately following or sometime in the very near future is low, then the preferred um, process is to give them notice of the end of their assignment represents notice of termination. Now, you can do it really nicely. You do it very professionally and say, this represents a termination. We're going to give you a record of employment so that if you need it, you will be qualified for unemployment insurance. But you are eligible to, eligible to be rehired at any point in time. We're very satisfied with your work. And so we hope that you'll stay in contact with us to keep us informed of your availability. And we will keep in contact with you with the opportunity for any future reemployment. You can do that. And it just sounds nicer, but at least effectively, and you issue a termination notice and a record of employment, at least then you've met all of your statutory obligations so that you didn't have to give them more notice because theoretically, if that person went to an employment standards officer three months later and said, hey, I was terminated by ABC Staffing Company and they never gave me notice, you'd have to prove that you terminated them and gave them notice. Otherwise, they're likely to get one or two weeks pay in lieu of the notice that you failed to give them. Again, this is not a common thing because everybody knows and people are thinking about where's their next assignment before so they effectively quit by didn't make themselves available because they knew their assignment was ending with you on Friday and they went and found another assignment that starts the following Monday and they weren't available. Had you even called them? And if you did call them, they weren't available. So there's lots of rules around this stuff, but 
the general rule of thumb is give them notice and terminate their employment if you have no expectation of reasonably employing them in the foreseeable future. Otherwise, you're on the hook. So to calculate the amount of termination pay an employee's assignment, you basically take the amount in case of termination that results in a layoff um, that's going to last 35 weeks or more. Um, then you go through, you got to figure out during the 12 week period um, pre preceding. Let me just go back one screen because I might have missed something here. You got minimum notice of one week. La la la. Okay. So um, I'm going to show you about how much notice is required for different um, terminations. Um, so if you're doing a layoff, um, then you've got 35 weeks. Um, not, I said to you, I can't remember what number I gave you before, 13, 12 weeks. Um, in the case of termination results for an ongoing layoff for 35 weeks or more in a 52-week period, then it as soon as it gets to 35 weeks, it becomes termination, but you can specify it to be a 12-week period. So if you're not bringing... If you're saying, I'm bringing you back, I'm bringing you back, I'm bringing you back, but you don't bring them back, then 35 weeks will be your trigger. If you say nothing, if you say this is indefinite layoff, I don't know, then 12 weeks uh, will be your trigger. So again, that goes to documentation. And um, we'll get to the calculation for that also. A week is counted as an excluded week if in that 35-week period or that 12-week period if the person is not available for work. So if you called them up and say, hey, are you available for work? If you offer them work and they refuse it, if um, they're subject to discipline, so they did something really bad and you put them on suspension. So there's lots of ways to get out of this termination thing. But again, it's all about documentation and truth and reality. And uh, it's difficult. So you're better off to just give them notice and terminate them or get them back to work again. Um, so how do you calculate this? It's all worded slightly differently and it's all fundamentally the same. So in Ontario, if a person worked for any amount of time, one day, one week, one month, three months, if they worked for less than one year, then they're entitled to one average week's pay. If they work for one year to three years, so in other words, they're two years or less, but more than one year. So they're not in their third year, then it's two weeks pay. So in British Columbia, they say the exact same thing. If you work for more than 12 months, which is more than one year and less than two, you get two weeks pay. So the wording is slightly different, but it's basically... One week in your first year, two weeks in your second year, three weeks in your third year, so on and so forth, or uh, after three years. So um, the some provinces, I'd have to check British Columbia to make sure it's, this is still accurate, but some provinces have a three-month period before you're qualified for anything. And in some provinces, like Ontario, they took that three-month period away. Now, of course, if you only worked for one week, your average your average pay over the preceding 30 days is only you know 5 days out of 20 so you'd only pay them 25% of one week so it becomes prorated based upon the amount of time that they work for you uh other provinces alberta 90 days, got to qualify for 90 days. Manitoba, 30 days, got to qualify for 30 days. So again, I'm not asking you to memorize these things for the challenge exam. Just remember the province that they're paid from or through, that they're hired in and report to, is the pro regardless of where they went to work, is the province that you need to look up their notice period. Now in Ontario, we've got, we call it termination and severance. So severance pay, now in common law, lawyers and employers 
and employees use the terms termination and severance interchangeably to mean the same thing. In Ontario statute, severance and termination are two entirely different things. They both have to deal with notice and pay and the amount of time that you work for a company. But we just talked about notice of termination that can be exchanged for money on termination pay in Ontario. But in Ontario, we have this other thing called severance pay, which is extra compensation that's added to the termination pay for qualified employers when that occurs when there's a long-term employee loses their job. <laughs> so severance pay is not the same as termination pay, um, which is given in place of required notice of termination. So termination pay is for notice, but severance pay is money only. You can't replace it with notice. So the person must have worked for the employer for five or more years, including all the time they spent by the employee in employment with um, the employer, which includes that inactive time. So if you had a temp who worked for you, let give you a really strange example that I'm sure would no one would ever complain about, but legally could. If you had a student who worked for you every summer, and at the end of the summer, you didn't have any documentation that says they quit or that you terminated them. Then they came back the next Christmas and then they came back at summer, came back at Christmas, came back at summer. And they did that for five years. According to common law and Ontario's now law and other provinces common law, this would be considered continuous employment with times of layoff or inactivity. And as a result of that, that person will qualify for severance pay because they've been employed with you for five years or longer. So first off, the employee has to have worked for you for five years or longer. Usually it's pretty straightforward. The person was on an assignment for five years or they worked on two assignments and it added up to more than five years or they were on a contract that lasted for a real long time, added up to five years. And the employer's payroll in Ontario, not in the world, not in Canada, but in Ontario, is greater than $2.5 million. Well, by the way, that's a pretty small staffing company, $2.5 million in annual payroll. So if you're a tiny little staffing company, it probably wouldn't apply to you. If you are um, not employing people for five years or longer, it won't apply to you. Um, it also applies to employers who severed 50 or more employees in a six month period because all or part of the business is permanently closed. So if you had people work for you, um, it doesn't matter if you're 2.5 million, it doesn't matter if they work for five years, if you lay off 50 people at a time, say, we're closing our office in North Bay, we're no longer going to be in business, we're telling you this, then you would owe them their notice, which you might have given them notice for closure next month. That part might have been covered. But you still would have owed them severance pay if it applied to 50 or more people. I'm going to guess that if you had 50 people working on temp assignments in North Bay, you probably aren't going to close your office. So, you know. It's not something that's going to happen, but keep that in mind. Those are the laws. It cannot be replaced by time or notice. Severance pay for long-term employees, for mm, larger than small companies, $2.5 million in payroll, and has to be paid in money, cannot be exchanged for notice. We've got all kinds of different types of leaves of work in different provinces. I'm not going to go through all the definitions. They're all slightly different, but you've got pregnancy and paternal leaves personal emergency leaves, family medical leaves, family caregiver leaves, organ donor leaves. There are reservist leaves for people who go or signed up to be a reservist and they get called to military duty. There's crime related um, things. There were some types of leaves that were added in Ontario and some that were repealed. So in Ontario, now we have a pregnancy loss leave. 
Um, we have family medical leaves. We have child death leaves. I mentioned that one earlier. It's two years of a your child dies, you can be guaranteed your job or fundamentally same or similar job. If you say, hey, look, I just got to take time, man. This is too much for me to handle. I'll be back. And they've, they don't have, they have to hold your job or something very similar to it for two years. Can't terminate you in that time period. We talked about the crime related disappearance things. There's now new legislation in Ontario and a similar legislation in other provinces that is a domestic or sexual violence leave. So if you establish or make a claim that a person is um, uh, harassed or the victim of sexual or domestic violence, they can take at least 13 consecutive weeks off and be guaranteed their job back up to 10 days and 15 weeks. Gets complicated. Now, this all makes sense. It's very kind and considerate and thoughtful and should be normal. People shouldn't complain about, as an employer, about having, you're not paying the person to be off. You're just guaranteeing their job back, you know. Um, but I got to tell you, this becomes challenging when you put a temporary worker out with a customer and they've been there for a year and a half and it's a two-year assignment, and they tell you, hey, I'm the victim of domestic violence, or, you know, my my mother is sick, I need to take um, family care leave, and you've got to say to the customer, this person is leaving, I've got to replace them. Okay, that happens every day, we deal with that. But what happens when they come back? In three weeks from now, is the customer obliged to let them come back? The answer is no. The customer is not obliged to let them come back. So you are obliged as the employer to give them the same or fundamentally similar. So now you got to get them an assignment. If the customer, maybe the customer will take them back. Maybe you worked it out with the customer. You're going to put a person in there for a short term indefinite period of time until they come back. And that everybody knows, including the person you put on the assignment, that their time, their days are numbered. But these become difficult challenges. Very difficult challenges. Same issue happens when the customer says, this person's terrible, I want to fire them. Well, they can't fire them. They can end the assignment. What are you going to do? Are you going to fire them because their performance was so poor that you're going to not only end their assignment, you're going to terminate their employment? Or are you going to, if the customer's being patently unreasonable and they're letting them go without notice for no cause, do you have something written in your agreement that says that regardless of what the Employment Standards Act says, does your agreement with your customer say that if they sign them up for a contract or for a period, that if they end it soon, they have to give you some kind of notice? There's employment, there's temporary staffing companies that have agreements with customers that say, Hey, this is a one-year assignment. If you choose to end the assignment early, you got to give us one week's notice. You can do that. Now you're tying together your contractual agreement with your customer to your statutory obligation agreement to your employee that might be tied together to your employment agreement with your employee. But when they're not the same, it can create a problem. You'll work it out. I know you will, but it can be a so Manitoba's got very similar leaves, bereavement leaves, compassionate care leaves, long-term leaves for serious illness. They call them different. The amount of time that they have off is different. So again, every province has got different standards, different wording. So on your challenge exam, it's not required that you memorize each province or your province or any particular province. But it is important that you understand if they say to you, is bereavement leave a typical leave that is often covered in employment standards? You got to know whether that is or that isn't. Okay. If you're in your actual day to day business, when you have a bereavement leave, you're, um, you need to go look it up for your province to see what it's like. This is in here. I thought I'd leave it in here because it doesn't really apply anymore. But to give you an example of the kinds of stuff that happens during COVID, we had the COVID worker income protection benefit, which was passed by 
uh, the Ontario legislature and other provinces passed similar legislation. Some provinces were quick to remove it. Some were quick to um, long to leave it in place. But on April 29th, 2021, the Ontario uh, COVID workers income benefit came into effect. Um, and um, the Employment Standards Act was temporarily amended to accommodate that. So employers were required at the time to provide eligible employees with up to three days off of paid infectious disease emergency leave. So you remember during all this time, the newspapers were filled with, well, what about legislating paid time off? Shouldn't we legislate companies to tell them how many sick days a year that they have to have paid off and unions got involved and advocacy involved and say those oh, bad and exploitive employers that don't have benefits and don't have paid days off because most employers either have paid days off policy or they've got a policy that says you can take a certain number of days off and be guaranteed your job back again and those policies can't be shorter than the legislation says but in ontario they came along and said, okay, you got to pay them. But guess what else Ontario did? Ontario said, there's a bunch of employers out there that can't afford this. And they have policies for sick days and things. And we don't want them to use up their eight paid sick days for COVID days. So if they're COVID days, let's make them change it. Then Ontario said, but an employer can make applications through the Workers' Compensation Board and get back three days pay. So the Ontario Workers' Compensation Board has a mechanism where we pay them our premiums and they pay us our rebates and refund. The, that was the only part in Ontario where the government had a mechanism with, for employment issues where they actually received and paid money to companies based upon the fact that they had in a workers' compensation WSIB account. So they said, okay, for each worker once, if they have COVID, you don't have to prove it. You just have to tell us what took off and we may come back and validate with them that they didn't get paid by you regularly, that you treated them for COVID and that they verify that they took the time off. But companies could make application without penalty to their, to their workers' compensation performance standards to get paid back again. So the province tried to find a way to introduce a mechanism to give time off. That ended on July 30th, um, the, that program they had. And uh, it was removed then from the Employment Standards Act. So um, they also had um, things like in the legislation that if you were sent off work, that it didn't count as notice period. So it didn't go towards the 13 week layoff period. So you could actually lay somebody off because you closed down for COVID and it didn't start the timer ticking for 13 weeks to say, okay, you've now gone for 13 weeks and the employee couldn't make an application that they were terminated. But on July 31st, 2022, the government said, okay, the clock starts again now. So bring people back to work. And if you don't bring them back to work, the layoff clock starts now. Okay. So if you had temporary workers that didn't have assignments during that period, they couldn't count that period towards their notice period and their layoff period. The clock started again on July 31st, 2022. So there were some interesting things that happened. There's there some new changes in Ontario that took place in 2022, also called the written policy on disconnecting from work which means that employers that have 25 employees or more on January 1st of that year must have a written policy about what employees are allowed to do to disconnect from work from their cell phones and from their email and their text messaging. So companies that had people working from home were sending emails out in the middle of the night and checking on stuff and asking questions and asking them, can you fill out this thing on Saturdays and Sundays and eight o'clock at night? And maybe for a lot of us, that was okay because we put the, took care of the kids in the morning when we normally would be sitting at our desk. And so we answered questions at eight o'clock at night after we put the kids to bed 
maybe that was okay. But as we go towards the end of the pandemic, the government finally said, okay, you know what? There's so many people working from home and remotely now, and they've got monitoring GPS things on their truck, GPS things on their phone, geofencing on their phone. We know where they are. We can track where they are. We're sending them text messages. They now said, we now have to have a policy in place. If you've got 25 or more employees telling people what your policy is, to disconnect from the workplace and what people's rights are. And the government gives you some minimum standards about that, but every company is going to have a slightly different policy. So it passed into law, the new Ontario Electronics Monitoring Policy. Bill 88 passed into law in 2022, became part of the Employment Standards Act, which we refer to the ESA 2000. And the reason why we call it 2000 is because the Employment Standards Act in the year 2000 was significantly modified, so they called it the ESA 2000. Ontario employer 25 more employees, includes all forms of employees and assignment employees, including temporary workers and remote workers and from home workers and so on. It includes GPS tracking, delivery vehicles, tracking websites for employee visits during their working hours. So if you've got, um, you know, internet, um, on their that you provide to them you can and or on their computers you might have tracking software on your computers it says hey we track what websites you go to so don't go to porn sites social media sites or other so shopping sites during business hours Do they track you on that kind of stuff but this legislation says yeah but you got to tell them that they are being tracked and you have to turn it off at certain times so if you're not going to track them after six o'clock at night, you got to turn it off. You can't track them after six o'clock at night. You have to have policies and notices about that sort of thing. This is another thing that most companies are doing a really terrible job at. Also in Ontario in 2001, they introduced the non-compete agreements, um, non-competition prohibition. So employers and employees that had employment agreements that said, Thou shalt not work for a competitor for a period of one or two years following your termination of employment with us. Those agreements became null and void. So you can't tell a person in Ontario now, and in most other provinces, there's common law, if there isn't statute around it. Common law means that the courts have already decided what the rules are about this, that you can't stop a person from working. And you can't stop a person from working from a competitor. And you can't stop a person from working for a company within a geographical region. These non-compete agreements were overzealous and harmful to the employee, not necessarily providing any benefit or any protection to the company. And so we said, okay, you can have non-solicitation agreements you can say, here's the customer that you had a duty to serve. And you know everything that's confidential about that customer. So we can stop you from trying to sell to that customer after you leave us. We have confidential information, which is property. We can stop you from stealing property. And memorization and use of confidential information is proven in the courts to be tantamount to the physical asportation or theft of property. So if you've got confidential information about customers, about their rates, their rate schedules, their buying models, information about your company, about your production methods, about your software, confidential information is confidential and it is protected in law, just like property is. You can't leave a company and steal your pencils when you go, and you can't steal information when you go. So non-compete agreements became null and void. So you couldn't tell you couldn't tell a temp in that you can't work for another temp company. You can tell a temporary worker you can't solicit them to sell them stuff but you can't stop them from applying for a job there. So you can say, hey, we've given you confidential information about our customer and you know that they do this stuff. You can't sell stuff to them. You can do that. You can't stop them from applying for a job there unless, of course, this non... Um, unless, of course, you can prove that they violated some sort of confidential information aspect of the agreement, which is almost impossible to withhold. 
or to prove. Can I ask a question about this? Um, can we require that an employee uh, report weekly the hours that they're working for another employer so that we can ensure that they're, um, for example, we are dealing with truck drivers and yeah. there are hours of service laws that they have to adhere to. So right. we need to ensure for public safety that they're not exceeding the hours of service rules. Right. Um, so we ask that they report, hey, I worked 10 hours on, on Monday. So then we know their availability and their maximums that they can work for us. You know what? I've never been... Uh, generally, no. Okay, so I, but I'm going to come back and say yes, um, probably with respect to drivers. I'm not... I've never been in specifically in the driver business, and I know that there's a whole bunch of special legislation for safety reasons like hours of work in the driver business. If the legislation says that you um, are under the driver portion, we can look this up, I guess, that they need to disclose to you that, then the answer is, yeah, you can ask them. You probably can't ask them where they went, who they worked for, but you can ask them whether or not they've been driving in a paid role and how many hours um, in the week they are working. You might have it as a regular, you might you might do it and say, are you regularly employed with another company? You might say, if you're asked on an ad hoc basis, you're required to disclose the number of hours to us. But generally speaking, notwithstanding the safety issue, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, you have to show that they're violating some use of confidential information or that it's a conflict of interest to you somehow. And, you know, the same, let's say, for example, would go with crane operators. Like, who would want to, or a heavy equipment operator on a job mm -hmm. site? You know, who would want a machine operator in a factory? If somebody went and worked night times in a factory somewhere else and came at seven directly to work at seven o'clock in the morning and only went home and slept for four or five hours every day, how long would it be until that machine operator made a mistake because they were overtired at work? Right. And, and so I would be concerned that we have some liability in that if we knew that they were working for another employer and say they you know, we're involved in an injury at our workplace. And then, you know, we go to court and the files are combined and we found mm -hmm. that this person's already worked 80 hours in the week when this injury occurred. Um, that's, that's my concern. Yeah. Um, I, I love it when somebody stumps me and I can tell you that I'm familiar with a couple of court cases that had different outcomes because the people who got injured sued the employer and the person. They had to deal with driving um, drivers, not necessarily um, like delivery delivery drivers. And people, one was a bus company, uh, was a bus driver driving kids. Um, they had different outcomes. And um, so I'm going to say... Yeah, better read the legislation in your jurisdiction with respect to that. Um, and like a lot of things, it it's going to depend. It's going to depend um, if there isn't specific legislation that I'm aware, unaware of. Um, it's going to depend upon exactly what you said. Were you aware of it? Did the employee exhibit behavior, previously exhibit behavior that they were not um, aware, awake? Um, and capable of operating that piece of equipment, that vehicle, that truck, or heavy equipment. Um, and so from a liability standpoint, if you are unaware, and then the next question will become, to what degree were you obligated to ask them personal questions about mm -hmm. their life that you're not entitled to? Because who knows why were they up all night because their kids were crying, because their kids were sick? because they're going through a divorce, because they have an illness, you know, like what, there's certain things that you can't ask questions about. So 
I mean, so your whole press is going to be around. Did they, was it reasonable for you to assume that based upon their previous performance and exhibited behavior that you ought to have known that this person was unsafely operating your equipment? And that's what a court case will typically come to. So it's one of those things like if you ask everybody all the time, they don't tell you, you might have limited your liability. If you ask everybody all the time and they tell you and you don't do anything about it, you might have increased your liability. So um, my answer is look for, I'm going to look too. look for legislation that specifically deals with the operation of vehicles and an employer or an employee's obligation to disclose and but conduct yourself in a manner where you always put safety first and if you see behaviors or hear behaviors of behaviors you know like say for example if you thought a person was under the influence of alcohol or drugs you would and you failed to address the issue um, even if they were taking some medication for medical reasons it would be your obligation to address the issue and then within the confines of safety and human rights make the appropriate decision right mm -hmm. very good thank you yeah that's yeah. a trick yeah. we deal with sometimes i can tr trust me I, I can see that one yeah. okay so um here's a new one for you the, um, that's maybe not that new. Uh, two years ago, the Ontario government announced that they were going to, in, this has been going on for years and years, um, comes a result of advocacy groups making out that uh, the case that temporary staffing agencies are bad, bad, bad for the economy, bad for workers, exploiting workers, taking advantage of people, ruining people's lives because they had temporary work opposed to full-time work. And they, of course, we make the case that we are helping people find employment, putting people in jobs quickly, getting work done, getting people into the workplace fast. We are that extra layer um, of advocacy checking because maybe some employers would violate the law knowingly or unwittingly. We are informed and knowledgeable, and so we act as an extra layer to make sure everybody is at a safe workplace. Are they working the proper hours? Are they getting their day off on public holidays? All that kind of stuff. We become that extra layer to make sure things are done right. But these advocacy groups and some people would say, no, we're the bad guys, and companies are hiring us to do their dirty work for them. And to some degree, they made some cases with it. Again, legislation is political. And so they felt that certain target groups of people would vote for them if there was um, if they acted like they were beating up temporary help companies. And in some cases, sometimes, not very often, but in some real cases, sometimes there are really bad actors in the temporary services industry, in the employment agency business, and in every other industry. And so the question was. Um, how do we police that? Well, typically, uh, those companies that adhere to the code of ethics and standards and become access members are not the bad actors. It's usually the ones that we don't know about that open a company, start to provide some kind of service by exploiting vulnerable workers, paying cash, not paying properly, not adhering to the laws, safety legislation, not registered for employers, health tax and workers' compensation. Those are the companies that typically find bad customers who want to find someone to do their dirty work for them. And they do exist out there. Although contrary to what these advocacy groups would like people to believe, and maybe some newspapers like to believe this is not the norm. Tens of billions of dollars of payroll are run through legitimate companies and small percentages of payroll run through Ill illegitimate companies. And I think we can say that about every industry, pretty much everywhere. In any event, the Ontario government decided and other provinces, Manitoba, British Columbia, Alberta, and Quebec, um, have already put um, and have had for many, many years employment agency licensing legislation in place. Ontario did have until 2011 Ontario agency licensing in place, and then it was repealed because it was serving no purpose. 
It had been in place for some 30 years and no agency had ever had their employment agency revoked or no one had ever been penalized, yet people were still complaining about bad actors. And we said, well, what's the point of making all the good actors pay money every year for a license when the bad actors get away with doing it all the time and the government's doing nothing about it? So we had them repeal the licensing in Ontario, but then sort of the 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 the, the um, looking glass got turned toward more toward temporary staffing companies and particularly towards foreign worker recruiters. And so they've introduced this new legislation. It was supposed to come into place on January the first. It was announced last year in July. It was um, um, for registration. It was supposed to come into effect on January the first, two thousand twenty-four. And then there were some problems, uh, surprise, surprise, in the rollout of it. And it has been delayed until July 1st, 2024. Um, there's no indications yet that it's going to be delayed again, although the progress that the government, the Ontario government making it, is making in some sort of formal format is here we are at the end of February, two months into the six-month notice period, and they haven't even opened up registrations yet. So who knows what's really going to happen. But for now, Ontario licensing will kick in and it will apply to employment agencies and temporary help companies. The um, uh, When making your application, you'll need to provide... Um, yeah, let me come back for a moment to say this about that. The difference between the current legislation and other legislations in other provinces and past legislation is that number one, it will apply to employment agencies and temporary staffing companies. Number two, it will hold customers liable for doing business with unlicensed agencies. And so if a agency is found out to be operating in the temporary um, staffing space or in the employment agency space, the customers that they've invoiced for services will be jointly and severally liable, which means that they can be found liable together or all on their own. Now, this is consistent with other legislation that was passed in 2018 and 2012, where customers were found jointly and severally liable for unpaid wages. So in Ontario and through common law in other provinces, if an employee a staffing service goes out of business or fails to pay its wages to its employees, regardless of whether or not the customer has paid its bill, if the agency has no money and they can't get the money out of the agency to pay wages to the workers, then they'll go after the customers and make them pay again. So, the notion of joint and several liability with respect to the payment of wages was supposed to stop companies from doing business with unscrupulous operators who might not pay their wages. Didn't I'm not familiar with any circumstance where an employer was forced to pay the wages of a temporary staffing company. So either it worked and everybody paid their workers or it didn't work. Nobody caught and nobody was held liable for it. So they're taking it one step further with employment agency licensing, saying if you do business with a company in Ontario that's not licensed, then you also can be fined. And it will now not only include employment agencies for the placement of permanent workers by fee to the customer, but also to temporary staffing agencies. So in order to get this license, you have to provide all the information, email addresses and addresses, of where the agency operates. It'll also have to provide information concerning the type of corporation it is, whether it's a limited liability corporation or an incorporated company or a partnership, who the directors and officers are. They'll have to show that those directors and officers um, are eligible for a license because those corporate officers and directors are not um, banned because of pr previous criminal backgrounds um, and, and convictions. And they'll also um, have to provide information um, with uh, connected companies. So if there's 50% ownership of this, but, you know, Steve owns 50% of that company, but he owns 100% of that company, you have to provide information to the government about the relationships between the companies. Uh, you know, there's a 
there's a case here on one of our screens called Fiera Foods, where the staffing company had multiple names and every few days the employees got paid through a different named company and Fiera paid invoices to whoever invoiced them. So you got to just make up numbers, a hundred workers all come to work Monday and Tuesday and work 14 hour shifts um, through company ABC. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, they work 14 hour shifts through company XYZ. And then on the next four days of the week, three days of the week. So they work seven days, no time off, no overtime pay. Uh, they work through company LMN and it's all the same owners, three separate companies. The employees get three separate paychecks, three separate pays. The Fiera Feud Foods gets three separate invoices for those three separate things. And they were using these multiple company facade in order to get out of hours of work, meeting certain limits, uh, million dollar deductions, unemployment standards, um, workers' compensation issues, overtime, public holiday pay calculations, all that kind of stuff. And it was, you know, one particular group of operators with one particular customer that made it into the media. And so this is the kind of thing that's supposed to stop that kind of ridiculousness from happening. We've got uh, other issues called reprisals. So basically, um, we've got 15 more minutes. I got to go fast. So basically in um, all provinces, um, employment standards legislation restricts a company from um, penalizing people for asking about their rights um, or trying to get their rights fulfilled. So if a person doesn't get paid for their overtime and they go to the employer and say, hey, man, you didn't pay me my time and a half for my overtime. And the company says, hey, look, uh, stop complaining or you're fired. And then they pay them and fire them or don't pay them and fire them or pay them and never give them lots of shifts anymore. That's called a reprisal. That's against the law in Ontario. In Ontario, we have to, in all provinces, we have to retain records um, concerning employment and payroll. Um, and um, usually the number is five years. Um, there's some things that need to be retained for seven years. Um, but generally, with respect to payroll records and Employment Standards Act, you need to hang on to stuff for five years. Um, so, you know, th there's some different legislation, in different provinces where they say you got to keep it for three, like timesheets for three, vacation records for five, keep it for five. Um, so we got to take, you know, vacation records. We have to keep their names and addresses and telephone numbers. We have to... Steve, for that uh, multiple choice question, the five years, was C highlighted too? Sorry. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's <laughs> it depends on the type of information. So it's like a trick question because different legislation, and this is it's my like point, two. is that <laughs> generally go with five years okay. because, because what you're going to find is that certain things like vacation records, you can see here has to be kept for five years, but things like uh, the timesheet records or the records you had for them clocking in, clocking out only have to be kept for three. But, you know, if, if you get sued, then it's common law. They usually, there's certain things like you can only be sued within one year. You know, so so every little bit of legislation Things around workers' compensation is three years. You know, so every piece of legislation tends to have, you know, they didn't when they when they made a change to a law, they didn't go back to every other law that they could possibly find that might have something to do with it and try to make them the same. So you're gonna see nothing, you're gonna usually see nothing less than three. You're usually gonna see nothing more than five. And so my recommendation to people is um if you think you're going to destroy or terminate records, go look it up and find out what it is in your province for that kind of record. But if you're going to keep things for three, man, keep them for five. <laughs> you know, just because the cost associated with getting rid of records, um, you know, it's not, you're not going to save a lot of money. You might, if in the days of bankers boxes, you might've saved space. <laughs> 
but you know most of them are electronic records now too um okay um so record keeping examples in manitoba uh, you got to keep the name address the date that people started all of their wages regular and overtime wages all their hours um what so all their timesheet data you got to keep records of when you paid them what deductions were taken from their wages, what overtime was banked, what was in the written agreements for that overtime, what overtime was paid, when holidays were taken, hours of work on general holidays. They work, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Copies of their work schedules. So again, um, Try to keep it electronically and try to keep it forever or at least for a minimum of five years because you never know what somebody's going to come back for. Okay, so Ontario temporary agencies have special legislation and other provinces have got either special legislation or common law. Um, it's particularly noted in Ontario, and we mentioned Ontario again, because they went out of their way to make it specific to temporary um, help agencies, temporary staffing agencies. So we have to tell people in Ontario, first off, they define what a temporary staffing agency is in the legislation. And they define what an assignment employee is in the legislation, although they now start to use this temporary TSA and TSW. So in the legislation, it's called an assignment employee, but in the other parts of their descriptions and their regulations, they call them temporary staffing workers and temporary staffing agencies. So you can see they're getting their own words kind of con convoluted. Um, they have they made sure that it was written to the legislation that they had a right to public holiday pay because prior to 2012, temporary workers were exempt. Some temporary workers were exempt from public holiday pay. They had the right to termination severance pay like every other worker. They had the right to notice of termination, as we discussed. They had the right to equal pay for equal work, so male-female comparisons. They had was put into the legislation that we could not charge any fees to a worker. Uh, that was not in the legislation before, although it was a heinous and terrible practice for those companies that tried to do it. Back in the early 80s, for example, they used to treat it like, um, yeah, um, you know, those talent agencies that you... you People would go in and say, oh, can you get me a job? And then they'd say, yeah, but we got to get your headshots. And then they charge you $400 to get your photos taken. And then once they got your headshots, they say, okay, you're registered with us. Now you got to pay a registration fee to the agency. Well, they also did that with resumes back in the early 80s. You could come and register with us, but you have to pay a red, uh, uh, you have to take our class and then you have to get your resume done and we'll charge you $200 to get your resume done. These were all terrible practices that were eliminated, you know, by 1985. They were pretty much gone. They didn't exist very much anyways, but they were there. But now, um, of course, when the legislation came along 25 years later, somebody remembered that. So they wrote it into the legislation. We have to tell people in writing the legal name of the agency. So if you're an operating as name, you know, so if it's... Um, you know, ABC staffing, sir, you know, Ontario 1224567 numbered company operating as the temporary company, then we have to tell them both all of our legal names. We also have to tell them the legal names of the businesses of our customers. I don't think we do that very often. I don't think we even think about that. We usually tell them the name that's going to be on the invoice that goes out to the customer. We have to put in writing to them what hours they're going to work, what their wages are going to be what their paydays are going to be. We can't punish them for asking for their employment standards rights. That's already covered in the legislation, but they particularly came out and said, okay, you agencies, temporary staffing companies, we're going to write it again, again for you because we think you're bad at that. We can't punish people for asking to get paid their vacation pay, public holiday pay, time off, so on and so forth, you know, holiday pay. Um, we they particularly wrote that we have to keep track of all these records that we proved that we provided all this in writing. So you know it's a really good practice to have your um, your um, your system or your process to generate emails, to generate notifications, 
or for you to have a templated email that tells people about where they're going, what they're getting paid, when they start, when they stop, who they're going to work for, who you are, what their page wages, because this is all required. I, I don't see the employment, um, employment standards branch going out there doing audits saying, prove it, prove it, prove it. But if they get a complaint from somebody saying they told me it was this and but it was that, they're going to come looking to say, are you providing this information to your workers? I talked to you about Bill 148. This is the joint and several liability. This is the legislation that I said to you that customers can become responsible jointly and severally for um, not paying of uh, wages and also for any ESA infringement. So if the temporary staffing agency is breaking employment standards act laws, they can go after your customer. Um, Bill 18 was the second phase in 2014, um, which had to do with the foreign nationals workers. So this had to do with um, joint liability for staffing firms and their customers for wages paid to people who were hired from outside of the country and brought here on temporary foreign worker permits. By the way, that's a huge emphasis now from the federal government and the provinces with respect to special legislation about temporary foreign workers because they're the ones that either are or the ones that are... I mean, hey, let's face it. People hire foreign national workers for three reasons. One, there's nobody available here with that skill. Two, there's nobody here available to do that terrible job. Or three, they think they can pay them less or treat them more poorly. Um, you know, so... Uh, employers will always tell you, oh, we treat our foreign nationals great. We give them a shack to sleep in, you know. Mm, um, it's um, it's a good place when it comes to the hiring of foreign nationals for legislation to kind of take uh, its spot. Um, so temporary workers, this is this one. So Bill 18 that I talked about two screens earlier, which is the joint liability for customers to share in the liability of unpaid wages. And it's also to limit um, occupational health and safety coverage for co-op students. So prior to Bill 18, co-op students were not covered under workers' compensation or safety legislation because they weren't employees. If you were a co-op student, you came and worked for free, then all the legislation always talk, talked about covering employees from their work. So Bill 18 basically said, um, uh, we're gonna treat co-op employees like employees and you have to calculate the, you know, the coverage for them and provide them with all the same benefits. Here's an interesting one as of last year. Business information and technology consultants is in huge print because this is a lot of things people don't know about. Um, were exempted from the Employment Standards Act in Ontario if they met certain criteria. So they had to be um, working in operations or accounting or profitability or procurement uh, or human resources or um, building structures. They had to be providing advice in some of these areas, information technology. They had to be making, oops, I think more than $40 an hour. And of course they had to um, think of themselves as an independent contractor, not as an employee. So if they already had a business, then the government got tired of fighting with employment agencies that were not paying overtime, public holiday pay to independent contractors who were invoicing them. So they basically said, okay, the contractors wanna be exempted so we don't need to protect them like we need to protect vulnerable workers. So they were exempted from the legislation. So, you know, um, basically this screen is supposed to say, hey, look, if you comply with employment standards legislation, um, your business is going to thrive. Everybody's going to be happy and safe. Um, we don't need to worry about some of this multiple questions. This is an example of what the posters look like. Uh, that's a 2015 poster. They all look a little bit different, but we've got obligations in Ontario to put provide information sheets to our workers. Um, Co-employment is a thing. 
Okay, we have one minute to go. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to go a little bit over time, but we're going to address some of the stuff tomorrow too in our next thing. So I'm going to talk for the next five minutes um, to take us to the end of this. If you wish to stay on, you can. If not, know that whatever's in the end here is going to get somewhat addressed uh, in our session tomorrow. Co-employment is really when we have this tripartic relationship where there is a customer and a staffing company that both share in responsibilities with respect to work. So a good example would be providing a safe workplace. So the um, Workplace Health and Safety Legislation in Ontario talks about the employer and their obligation towards their employees, but they talk about the workplace and they get the words confused and convoluted because there could be independent contractors there and there could be visitors there and there could be employees there. And then we are the employer of temporary workers because the legislation specifically says in Ontario, you are the, the temporary staffing service is the employer, not the customer. So now we're the employer sending it to our customer's work site who has direction and control and supervision responsibilities. And they've got the rights to manage the work site and the equipment and the safety of the workplace. So now we've got this co-employer responsibility where we're the employer of the employees going to a place, do we know that the place we're sending them to is safe? And so if an order were to be um, issued by the Workplace uh, Health and Safety Board or by um, the Ministry of Labor or by the Workers' Compensation Board, um, they would likely issue the order to both of us because we've got a co-employment responsibility. So the legislation and employment standards says specifically, hey, staffing company, don't wipe your hands of any of this stuff because we are putting it right in the statute that you are the employer. And the other legislation is saying, hey, Mr. Employer, don't wipe your hands of this because we're going to make you responsible for the workplace. Not necessarily just the employees in the workplace. And so all of a sudden we've got this co-employer or three-part relationship. And often in relationship, we talk about responsibilities because the responsibilities go to two questions. Number one is, is this an employee? And the second question is, if it is an employee, whose employee is it? So it becomes very clear in Ontario, but not necessarily other provinces, by statute, the employer is the temporary help company, except of course, if you're a business consultant or IT worker, where now they've exempted those workers and said they could be independent consultants. So now we've got this confusion. Some people are independent consultants and the Employment Standards Act doesn't apply. If they are an employee, they're an employee of the staffing agency, but we've got other legislation that has to do with workplace health and safety and co-employment. So other places might have some responsibility. So they look at things like who's got responsibility for onboarding, who's got responsibility for managing their time and their schedules. They look at the customer and say, who's got responsibility for defining the job description and providing culture in the workplace and servicing the work. And then they talk about the, the temporary staffing agencies, um, you know, so the first part is the agency who's finding this people and counseling. The second one is the customer. And then the third one is the temporary employee who's got some responsibilities with respect to learning from onboarding and looking at those workplace safety data sheets and knowing where they're stored and understanding how they apply. So um, it's never going to be clear. We need to know that even though the staffing agency is the employer of record in Ontario, and in most provinces. And so all the Employment Standards Act apply to them. Every other aspect of legislation, including Employment Standards Act, could be translated in, in joint, which means shared, or several, which means separate responsibilities of the same things to our customer um, based upon the circumstances. So we are risk by very, being very clear upfront and in writing with our employees and our customers about who has responsibility for what. We constantly review that. We coach and counsel our employees and our customers as we go along.
We um, communicate it regularly and we take a joint and several responsibility for doing what we need to do to mitigate risk. If we stand in our customer's shoes, we can understand what they might be never saying to us, but expecting from us. And so having um, conversations and proof of information around those things, like proving that you've got your insurance, asking or finding out whether or not you need to have your um, customer ad as additionally insured on your insurance policy. Requesting information a customer might want to request annual report financial statements from you or your credit worthiness before they want to get stuck with paying your payroll that you failed to pay. You want to ask your customers for references and they may want to ask you for references. Basically having these kind of discussions and executive to executive discussions and visits to your customer's office and providing this information and asking for this kind of information is really the only way and meeting with them and communicating with them is that we can guarantee that we're mitigating risk. So co-employment is a dual responsibility. I talked about this um, ad nauseum. And then this elect to work, I don't need to spend any time in this, but it's not a thing. It is a term that used to be used in Ontario and around, still is used in the United States that says, so basically I'm saying to you this, if you hear the term, the employee is elect to work, ignore it, it's wrong. Because the notion of where an employee has the right to elect to work or not to work when requested to do so would exempt them from certain legislation, regulations and obligations is a thing of the past in Ontario and the rest of Canada. The fact that they can say, I'll take that assignment, I won't take that assignment, I'll take that assignment, I won't take that assignment, no longer makes them a different kind of employee. They are now entitled to all the rights of an employee under the Employment Standards Act. And honestly, because now they're naming temporary staffing services and agencies, additional rights and privileges that maybe don't even exist for regular employees. So if you hear this phrase, you hear a customer say to you, yeah, but they're elect to work. The answer is, yeah, no, they're, they no longer not a thing anymore. We can't charge fees um, to a candidate for hiring them. We also can't charge fees to our customers in Ontario after six months of them being on assignment. So if we send a temp worker out on assignment for six months or longer from the date of their first day on assignment, we're not allowed to charge a fee in Ontario anymore. And that lasts for at least a year after they've left that customer. So if they went to work for one day, five months ago, and you present that resume as a temp worker, and you present that resume to the same customer for any job in Ontario, you're not allowed to charge a fee for that. They thought they were helping workers. I'm not sure how they're helping workers. They thought that fees are creating barriers to people getting employment. Of course, we were always negotiating temp to perm and transition agreements and all kinds of things. So they thought they were helping, but just know you can't charge a fee to a candidate and you can't charge a fee to a customer after six months on assignment. There's a bunch of links to the back of the package that were sent to you. Some of them are probably a little bit outdated. I'm going to add some more links to it for people in other provinces that we went over by eight minutes today. I'm really sorry about that. I said to you up front, two best and most important things, starting on time, finishing on time. Um, I missed the mark today. Um, we're on again tomorrow. We're probably going to finish early tomorrow, make up for it because a bunch of those screens about um, the different types of laws, statute law, common law, constitutional law, those are all in the presentation tomorrow. We won't be covering that stuff tomorrow. We're just going to mention it and move on. Um, if you have any questions, please stay on the line. I'll stay here. Um, and if you're still here, I just want to say two things. Number one is there's a conference in May in Toronto. The Association Access Conference is the only opportunity you get in Canada 
to go to a professional conference with two and a half days of speakers who are specifically talking about the issues of our industry and perm and contract and temporary help recruitment, operating of agencies, technology, um, recruiting, sales. It all happens at an access conference. You can't get it anywhere else. You can go for 500 bucks or a thousand bucks here or there and find on non-industry speakers who are probably great, but they're not from the staffing industry and they won't give you two and a half days of it for the price. So if you are thinking about going to a conference this year, if you're an owner operator and you'd like to figure out where to take a vacation, take it in May in Toronto and hook it decide to your conference um, that you go to here. Use it as a reward um, or a training opportunity for employees. Um, take a look at the um, Access website. Look for Access Conference Toronto in May. And um, secondly, I encourage you to email me. You can email me at steve.jones. I'm just going to give you a generic email address because I have several. At bell, B-E-L-L dot net. Steve.jones at bell dot net. If you've got a question about today's uh, presentation, um, you want to stump me again on drivers and uh, their other uh, employers' work, um, ask me. I will do the work to get you the right answer. Um, but please, if you feel like you're a little confused about something that happened today or you've got a scenario you want some question to, please send it to me directly. If it's a really great question, I'll protect your name and um, send the answer to everybody. Um, and if it's really specific to you, I'll just send the answer back to you again. Um, you can send that through Jennifer to and then to me or directly to me. Um, I'm going to stay on the line for those of you who are leaving. Thank you very much for putting up with our extra 